Good evening, everyone. I will call our meeting to order. Our regular city council meeting be um, being held virtually via WebEx of December 8th, 2020. Meeting of the year. If you could all, um, all of those who are able, please put your camera on and if you could unmute yourself and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag, the flag of, the flag of the, United the United States of America, America. Republic, to for which the Republic for which it stands, stands one nation, under God, under God, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thank you, everyone. The next item is our open forum, and I will pass it to staff to just explain how folks can participate in the open forum and then also see if anyone is on the line. Thank you, Mayor. I do have our lines open. Residents are able to participate live in our open forums here at the City Council meetings. You can contact me ahead of meetings by dialing 612-861-9711 prior to our council meetings if you'd like your comments read. You can also send them to kwynn at richfieldmn.gov ahead of the meetings so they can be read. Um, you can also participate live during the meetings and call 612-861-0651. You'll be connected to me and we'll patch you through to the live meetings. Um, I do have, I don't have anybody currently on the line, but I do have um, a letter that I did receive via email. And so I will read that for you very quickly here. Um, Madam Mayor and Council Members, First, I would like to express my appreciation for all of you and for all that you and staff members do for the city of Richfield, especially during the his historic time in our health history. With that in mind, tonight's agenda includes approvals for additional public works equipment and a Wood Lake Path project. Personally, I don't agree with the approval of either of these requests, especially the Wood Lake project during this pandemic. Added together, they represent close to a million dollars when the future economy isn't going to recover as quickly as this budget is projecting. I am asking each of you to please vote to put a hold on non-essential expenses in all areas and ask for detailed cost benefit justification reports for any expenditure over X amount of dollars, either temporarily or permanently, especially if it affects the general fund. My proper taxes can pay for only so much, so please accept no more bids or sign any contracts unless pre-approved until the extents of this residual effects of the pandemic are known. We have money unemployed and hungry residents and should be sending non-essential budgeted monies there. In addition, please look at the request for the monthly compensation for personal car usages mileage compensation, and monthly on-call compensation with RF cell phones. The on-call compensation is written in such a way as to compensate every Public Works employee that pr brings their RF cell phone home an additional $1,200 per year. I suggest that these line items be given more detail, such as number of qualifiers and requirements prior to authorization by the council and overall effect on the salary budget line item. One qualifier for all of these perks increases their salary by over $4,000 annually. Again, please place a temporary hold on any and non-essential expenditures. While doing so, please keep in mind that some of us are hungry and worried about being evicted. While the city wants to further tax me for some new non-essential trucks and $715,000 for repairing a park path. Thank you for sharing your time and skills for the betterment of our community. Respectfully, Kathleen Balaban at 6526 Stevens. I do have someone on the line, so if you give me just a moment here.
that was a call for the a public hearing later on. So, um, yep, that was uh, the one comment I had for the open forum, and I do not currently have anybody else on the line. All right, we will wait just a few moments more before we close the open forum, and then we can just um, mention also, I'll mention how um, we follow up with open forum comments and requests after um, we hear that nobody else is on. So I'll just wait a little bit. Can you guys see me? Yes, we can see you, Councilmember Garcia. Oh, good. Because I, I, you know, the thing is, is that my, if my computer is running slow, so I'm, so I'm trying to get the the video from the computer and the audio from my phone. Yep, I do see your internet cutting in and out, but um, we can see you now, and it's good that you have your phone um, connected as well. Good. All right, I'll ask one more time if anybody is um, here for the open forum, otherwise I'll close it. Mayor, I do not have anybody else on the line. All right, I will close the open forum. And then I just wanted to ask um, City Manager Rodriguez, just so we can communicate with folks, um, there was multiple questions and asks um, in that letter to the council. The open forum is a period of time where folks can come and make statements and share their thoughts with the council, but it's not kind of a discussion back and forth period. And I know we've talked with staff about following up with um, residents when they do have very specific requests and then possibly sharing that update at the following council meeting. So is that, could you just um, talk through how we'll respond to Ms. Balaban's um, request? Yes, thank you, Mayor. And this is a new process. Um, we are we are pulling together the details, but what we'll do is we will we have always gotten back to residents um, or any stakeholders who made comments at the public hearing or the open forum rather. And um, now we will then follow up at the next council meeting and just publicly read those answers. So we will plan to do that going forward. And this is a, this is a new process that we're implementing. Thank you, city manager. All right, so the next item on our agenda is the approval of the minutes of the special city council meeting of November 13th, 2020, the special city council meeting of November 13th, 2020. I think someone might, there we go. Um, the city council HRA planning commission work session of November 24th, 2020, and the city council meeting of November 24th, 2020. Councilmember Whalen, I'll move to approve minutes. I will second Mayor Garcia. Thank you. The minutes, the motion has been made by Councilmember Whalen and seconded by Councilmember Garcia. Analyst Martinez Gavinia, could you please take the roll call vote? Mayor Reagan Gonzalez? Aye. Councilmember Stoppel? Aye. Councilmember Chapman? Council Member Garcia? Aye. Council Member Whalen? Aye. We have five ayes. Thank you. The minutes have been approved. The next items on our agenda are two presentations um, annual report presentations from both the Sustainability Commission and the Transportation Commission. So we will start with the Sustainability Commission, and we have the chair, Amanda Keeper, with us um, to give the update. So I'll pass it over to Amanda. Thank you, Mayor Gonzalez. Thank you, Council. Um, I also want to thank uh, the City Sustainability Coordinator, Rachel Lindholm, for preparing tonight's annual review. Um, I, I just wanted to note that the Sustainability Commission is a new commission. This is our first year. And so between uh, being a new commission and starting our meetings a little later and the pandemic, we were only able to hold seven meetings this year instead of the standard 10. But um, those have been seven productive meetings and we've had a lot of opportunity uh, as a commission to um, learn about the past and present sustainability efforts of the city um, and had opportunities to contribute um, and provide recommendations to city staff regarding those efforts. So I'll just highlight four efforts that um, we've worked on this year. 
Uh, the first and, and kind of the lion's share, I think, of, um, of our efforts for this year uh, were around providing feedback to staff on the Richfield Climate Action Plan. Um, and we spent uh, multiple meetings um, kind of combing through that report and providing feedback to staff before uh, the report was recommended to council and approved by council. Uh, the second item um, is the commission spent some time brainstorming and recommending uh, community members and ideas for different organizations who might be interested in participating in um, Richfield's partners in energy efforts. Uh, those efforts are ongoing now and, and will be ongoing through 2021. Um, the third item I wanted to touch on is uh, uh, the commission has been working on uh, drafting some recommendations um, for council related to uh, forming a tree, pre tree preservation policy for the city. So earlier this year, there was a lot of community interest um, from residents around a specific popular tree that was removed from the Lunds parking lot and that um, generated some public discussion. And following that event, the commission received our first public comment um, uh, from some residents who were interested in this idea of the city um, developing a tree preservation policy. And so currently the commission is working on drafting a letter with some recommendations to council on how to proceed uh, in developing that policy in 2021. Uh, and, and we hope to be able to submit uh, to submit that letter early in 2021. And then the final thing I wanted to touch on um, is that the commission has been learning about organized collection um, as the city is uh, pursuing investigating uh, that process and uh, that option for the city. Um, and in, in learning about that, uh, the commissioners have also been engaged um, in working on outreach and education uh, to residents for example, through the Richfield Community Facebook page um, and trying to help direct residents to the city website on organized collection and to staff so that residents can learn more about the topic and submit comments um, to the sustainability coordinator regarding the topic. And that's something we expect um, to, to be a big portion of the Sustainability Commission's efforts in 2021 as well. So that is all I have. Um, thanks again to our staff, um, city staff who work with the Sustainability Commission and um, thanks again, Mayor and Council. Thank you for the review, um, Amanda. And I just wanna give you a special thanks for being the chair and playing that leadership role, but also you are one of the folks that came to us a while back talking about how we should have a Sustainability Commission and all the great things that we could do and now um, you're a part of it and you're helping lead that. So um, that's just one great example of the many that we have of how our residents working with us, you know, can create really great, really great outcomes. So thank you for your leadership on the Sustainability Commission. Any comments okay. from council members? Council Member Troutman. Thank you, Mayor. And um... Thank you, Commissioner Kuyper. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much. I remember several years ago when we sat down for coffee and you're talking about um, organized uh, um, yeah, organic uh, organic waste. And um, I just appreciate that you have such a great blend of passion and commitment that line up. And this commission just reflects your leadership and I know reflects the work of all the commissioners. It is such a young, commission, but you guys have accomplished so much on issues that are really important to our city. And so I just want to say thank you as a neighbor. Thank you. But as a resident, um, I just really am appreciative, uh, appreciative of your leadership. So please keep up the good work. Thank you, Mayor Reagan Gonzalez and Council Member Travin. Um, there's been a lot of community interest around forming a sustainability commission. So it's great to see it come to fruition this year. And to see all the energy that residents have to do some of this good work in Ridgefield. It's exciting. Great. And Council Member Whalen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanna say thank you to the commission as well and to um, all of the, the work that staff has put into the uh, 
just making sure that even as a new commission that there's super meaningful things they can dive into right away um that that came from um as commissioner keeper shared from both Things that had been in the works or that we knew needed to be in the works and new ideas that came from residents as as we as the year went along. So I'm really excited about that. I also um, will just note that as we're hearing our um, annual reports from commissions that we may end up repeating this multiple times, but applications are currently open for our commissions and boards um, as a city. So if you are listening to this and wanting to get involved in shaping the future of our community, um, that's a great way to, um, to be a part of it. And there's all sorts of different um, topics. We'll hear from two of them tonight and heard from some at the last meeting, but um, yeah. And that, that information is on the city website along with the application. Are there, there comments? Oh, yeah, if I could if I could just add on to that, um, I would mention that the Sustainability Commission does not currently have any youth members. Um, we have in our charter space for two youth members. Um, and with the pandemic, it's very understandable that uh, that didn't happen this year. But um, if that's something that anyone is interested in in 2021, we are definitely still interested in um, having some youth involvement in the Sustainability Commission. So that's something to keep in mind. Thank you. Any last comments from council members for the sustainability commission? All right, well, thank you so much, Amanda, for coming and presenting to us. Our second um, presentation tonight is the transportation commission annual presentation with the council with chair Wes Dunzer. I will pass it to you, Wes. Hello, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and council members Garcia, Troutman, Supple and Whalen. Um, thank you for this opportunity to brief you on the work of the transportation commission. Um, and uh, inform you on what we've undertaken this past year and bring your attention to the issues and opportunities that lay ahead. Since we last met, the Ridgefield Transportation Commission has spent time understanding, questioning, or recommending on many different issues. And I'm gonna fairly quickly go through what those are um, month by month, just to give you an idea of what the workload is, has looked like. Um, starting last November, uh, we began discussion on the MinDOT 494 vision concept. Uh, during that meeting, we also talked about 66th Street, Lindale Avenue, the Portland Bicycle Gap Project, the Penn Corridor Study, and the Safe Roads to School Program. Moving into December, we focused more on the Penn Corridor Study, uh, began diving more into 494 alternatives, talked about 65th Street, and again, the Safe Roads to School Program. The beginning of this year, January 2020, we began looking at the 494 interchange and evaluation and the screening process for that. We also began looking further into the 66th Street and Portland Roundabout redesign and 65th Street from Ray Drive to Nicollet um, and the Safe Routes to School. Our February meeting was canceled. In March, we welcomed new commissioners. We spent more time talking about uh, the Penn Avenue study talked about 66th Street, Streetscape and Poetry. We talked about the 494 Airport to 169 project. We also talked about the 494 and Highway 5 resurfacing project and 65th Street. Our April meeting was canceled. Uh, moving on to May, it was much of the same and some new things, 65th Street, 66th Street, Nicollet Mill and Overlay, 35W between 76th Street and 66th Street, both 494 projects, and Penn Avenue. In June, we talked about 65th Street again. Um, we discussed the Lindale pedestrian improvements. We had a response from 494, uh, excuse me, we had a response from MnDOT on some of our 494 concerns, discussed 35W at length, uh, spent a good deal of time discussing the Wendy's driveway at 65th Street and had a long uh, productive conversation on equity uh, as it pertains to 65th Street. In July, we had a presentation from MnDOT on equity. Uh, we reviewed another response letter from MnDOT on 494 and continued to discuss the Penn Avenue and 35W projects. In August, it was more time on 494, Penn Avenue and 66th Street. In September, we took a deep dive into the Penn Avenue project. Uh, we looked at the problems and different proposals for those problems and also uh, reviewed the Hennepin County overlay plan. 
In October, we took a look at the detailed design of 65th Street, including trail widths, Wendy's access, planted medians near the hub, the Pillsbury intersection, and the Richfield Lake Trail access, uh, with a little bit of time spent on Penn Avenue and 494. November was canceled. Uh, in December, just this past meeting, we spent some time again on 494 project in Penn Avenue. So during this past year, the Transportation Commission has benefited from all of the members of the Transportation Commission. Uh, the members are myself, Ken Severson, who is vice chair, Kuznia Bradley, Molly O'Howard, Kyle Schmidt, Dan Edgerton, Jeff Walls, Lou Jerzak, and Paul Chilman. Ken Severson uh, is an engineer and brings his depth of knowledge and experience to the commission. Ken is able to push back on technical answers and help ensure all options are truly represented and on the table. Ken is always willing and able to call a thing by its name and push back on inferior proposals that have political limitations masquerading as engineering limitations. Kuznia Bradley steps out and speaks up anytime there's an opportunity to call attention to an existing inequity or a future one. And she pushes the commission to see, to understand, and to consider the views of those most negatively impacted. Molly O'Howard, who's new to our commission this year, has an eye for seeing the big picture and will ask for historical context whenever necessary. Molly desires to define the problem in as clear of terms as possible and make sure that everyone agrees with the problem and how it is defined. Her involvement ensures that the proposals being considered are measured by their ability to solve the problem. Dan Edgerton is a transportation planner and brings his experience and knowledge to every meeting. Outspoken and amiable, Dan bridges disagreements on details by uniting on objectives and readily suggests win-win alternatives. Kyle Schmidt focuses on listening to what is said and importantly, what is not said. When rival viewpoints have rested, Kyle speaks up to ask the questions that others would have missed. Kyle's open-minded, holistic attitude helps the commission make better decisions. Jeffrey Walls knows what is the right path when he hears it, and his outspoken nature helps guide and direct our most important decisions. When Jeff is convinced of the right route that should be taken, he defends his position with clarity and conviction. Lou Jerzak brings a new level of focus and attention to the commission. Able to pick up and notice flaws or fallacy, Lou is outspoken in calling attention to inaccurate conclusions or premises. His inquisitiveness and demeanor is a logic check on the problems and proposals the commission works on. And lastly, Paul Chilman. Uh, he will often be the first to say he does or does not like something and why. Independent and focused on how the majority of people will experience a situation, Paul is eager to find the best possible solution and when it's found, advocate for it. Paul encourages a spirit of civil discourse in the best possible sense. And perhaps most importantly, Paul is willing to change his mind if new information changes the context. Um, going forward, there are two major areas related to transportation that I would encourage city leaders to consider any time they are presented with a transportation discussion. Uh, and these two things that you can ask yourself is, how is equity being considered? And number two, how does this prepare for the future? Um, the context in which I'm going to address an equity metaphor, I wanna be very clear, relates to people without disabilities. Equity for people with a disability and equity for people without a disability are ethical imperatives for a civil society, an imperative which we have thus far fallen short as I speak only of the latter, one should not construe that I personally have a deference for one or the other. My deference is for equity. And I hope that you, the listener, understands that my intention and what I'm about to say is to separate and understand equity issues to create an informed and actionable position. I believe a better understanding of either one will result in a better, clear, more actionable understanding of both. Um, I know that without a doubt, every person here and on the Transportation Commission wants a transportation system and a society that is entirely equitable. And that should be our goal. And even if 100% equity is not immediately achievable, we should be as close to that goal as is possible. And given how important equity is and the many conversations that have taken place this year regarding equity, 
it is extremely important that equity be understood correctly. If in earnestness one applies an incorrect understanding of equity, then those efforts, no matter how sincere, will not achieve that virtuous and principled goal. As if, if one were to earnestly follow a map to this destination using a broken compass, one's desire to reach the destination is no less real, but the broken compass leads astray. And the equity graphic that we were presented this year, I spent a lot of time thinking and studying and, and, and working on. And what it does is it shows three different sized people trying to see over a fence. And that I believe is our broken compass. And there's a dangerous assumption made that inequity starts at the individual level. The image shows that the reason two of these three people cannot see over the fence without a crate is because two of the three individuals have an inherent height problem. And I looked up inherent just to make sure I understood the context correctly. And it means existing in something as a permanent attribute or quality. And if we were to use this graphic to guide equity, then it means that underperforming students who attend underperforming schools are as individuals inherently less capable of being educated than others. It means that they need a crate because their brain is metaphorically shorter than others. This graphic states that those who need help are inherently unable to do so otherwise because of a permanent problem that is part of their nature. Essentially what it says is that those who require assistance lack the physical or mental ability, just like the shortest person in the graphic is inherently short, they are unable to grow taller and therefore require a crate. This understanding I believe is completely wrong and should be rejected. Students who attend Richfield Public Schools are just as capable of learning and academic vigor as those who attend Holy Angels or any other school. The graphic states an individual's performance in school is based solely on their individual ability to receive instruction, and that is simply wrong. And the same applies to transportation and the ways that we're looking at it. Instead, this cartoon should be redrawn, showing everyone is the same height, and yet only one person can see the field. The next question should then be, if all three are the same height, how can only one see the field? Now we're getting somewhere. We're no longer assuming that the ability to see the field is based on an inherent individual attribute. Now we see there's something outside of the individual that is at the root of this inequity. Consider this mental image for just a moment. Three individuals who are all the same height, the fence is the same height and the ground is even, the top of the fence is the same distance above each of their heads, and none of them have anything to stand on to make them taller. Between each of them is a protruding wall, so they cannot see one another. The person on the far left has a fairly large hinged window with a handle in front of him. He can pull the handle and has a great view of this field. He can close the window if anyone should get suspicious in order to hide his advantage. The person in the middle does not have a window, but there's a small gap in between the fence post that he can peer through just enough to see blurry shapes and colors, but not enough to see what is going on. And the person on the right has nothing and cannot see the ball field. The person on the left is frequently accused of having some sort of advantage that others don't, but he constantly reacts to the game in real time. Problem is, anytime he's accused of an unfair scheme, he points out that the fence is the same height for everyone, so there's nothing unfair or unjust. As you can see with this metaphor, it raises a lot more questions, and I believe much more accurately depicts the real equity issues affecting our society and transportation today. Each person is equal in ability, none have inherent individual attributes that make them more or less capable of seeing the field in this metaphor. The root of their inequities comes not from within themselves, as in the ones where they're in different heights, but from outside themselves. The fence, the system, prevents most and allows some to see the field. Those who cannot see the field are told and made to believe that it's their fault, inherent with themselves as individuals. I encourage you to use this metaphor to understand equity and to make sure that your solutions favor giving everyone a window or lowering the height of the fence for everyone instead of no one getting a window or no one gets to see the field. There's no lack of resources, just an inequitable distribution of them. And second and lastly, how does, do we prepare for the future? Minnesota used to be renowned for innovation and in answering the question, how could we make this better? We need to bring that back for many reasons, but the one I will impress today is purely practical. By the year 2030, self-driving cars will be as common as Uber and Lyft is today. 
Electric cars will have replaced non-electric cars in annual sales. Many countries, including the UK, have already passed laws to outlaw non-electric cars by the early 2030s. Electric cars and self-driving cars are not a distant thought. They're here now, and in just a few short years, they will revolutionize our transportation system and cause a larger disruption than the internal combustion engine did with the horse and wagon. We have to be asking ourselves, what then are we doing now with the hundreds of millions of dollars spent on transportation projects to prepare for this future? The unfortunate answer is that we are doing very little to nothing. The MIN.494 project is scheduled to break ground in the mid-2020s with completion near 2030. The Commission has asked MinDOT on several occasions how they are considering the self-driving car future, and they simply are not considering it. It is a waste and a misguided opportunity to ignore this coming future. If we are building a transportation system designed to last 30 years to fix a problem that will be non-existent in 10 years, then what are we spending these millions of dollars on? These questions pertain not only to large transportation projects, but all transportation projects. How can stoplights, crosswalks, bicycle lanes, bus stops, traffic lanes, parks, parking lots, etc., be prepared for the future? These questions regarding the future, when considered with systemic inequity, will provide leaders and decision makers, such as yourselves, an excellent opportunity to innovate and solve both problems in the same project. In the same way, it makes sense to replace old water mains when a road is already torn up instead of having to tear up a brand new road. We should make the same kind of considerations with equity and future tech. I wanna thank you for allowing me to brief you today and for allowing me to serve on the Ridgefield Transportation Commission. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wes, for the presentation. Any comments or questions from council members? Council member Supple. First of all, I want to say thank you to Wes and all the rest of the commission, and thank you for all of the thoughtful comments and giving us something to think about. I think that's really, really important. And I also want to point out that Richfield is one of the few cities that has a transportation commission, and I think Wes has just demonstrated why that's such an important thing to have. So thank you all for your service. Comments or questions from other council members? Council member Troutman. I just want to say uh, thank you, Commissioner Dunzer, and, uh, and I appreciated you uh, calling out all the names uh, of the of the transportation commissioners. It just reminded me just how how much I really appreciate and and like so many of the folks uh, on the transportation commission. And of all the commissions, it's one of those commissions that tends to get a lot of um, more dynamic feedback. And so, a special thank you for you and everybody else that ha that receives you know tough and really direct criticism. And I appreciate that um, we have a commission where people can share those, not not criticism personally at each other, but really look and, and critique each other's ideas and wrestle with tough problems. And I'm really grateful for the, um, just, just the level of technical capacity and insight that we have from so many people. And I appreciate too, just I really liked how you talked about the gifts, the giftings and strengths of different commission members, and I'm sure they appreciate that too. So, um, thank you, friend. I appreciate that, and um, yeah, and thanks for your leadership. All right. Any other questions or comments from council members? I'd like to just add um, appreciation to the commission as well for just leading in partnership with the council and all of our other commissions and staff on such important projects um, that we continue to need to be vigilant or vigilant, sorry, vigilant about like the 494 project, like um, the DU line coming in. We have so many changes to our infrastructure and so many partners on these projects and making sure that um, we're always looking out for the best interests of our residents and taking the long view. Um, that's exactly what the Transportation Commission does. They flag issues, questions, and um, they're just such a great group that we lead collaboratively with. So I just want to extend thanks for that. And then I don't know what kind of space you have to, to work on some of that visioning work. I know the Transportation Commission a lot of times response to projects that we're working on now. Um, but, you know, are, is there time that the Transportation Commission can 
carve out to say, what does the future for self-driving cars look like for Richfield? What does the future look like um, to take it to the next level for equity? So you can help us do some of that visioning and exploration and planning up front. So I know you always have a full agenda with existing projects, but if there's any way to help carve that out and work together on that visioning for our community, that would be, that would be great. Thank you for your leadership, Chair Dunzer. Are there any last questions or comments from council members? All right, thank you so much for the presentation and your leadership. Thanks, Wes. Next item on our agenda is approval of the agenda. Council Member Supple, I'll move approval of the agenda. Council Member Trout, uh, Troutman, second. Thank you. The agenda has been moved by Council Member Supple and seconded by Council Member Troutman. Um, any comments or questions from Council Members on the agenda? Council Member Warren. Um, just to note, do we have the Richfield Foundation as well? Nope. Or am I, I looking at an old um, it January. Got it. Okay. Sorry. Nope, not a problem. Any other questions or comments on the agenda? All right, Analyst Martinez Gavinia, if you could please take the roll call vote. Mayor Riga Gonzalez. Aye. Council Member Supple. Aye. Council Member Chalkman. Aye. Council Member Garcia. Aye. Council Member Whalen. Aye. We have five ayes. Thank you. The agenda has been approved. The next item is a pretty lengthy consent calendar, so I will pass it on to City Manager Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor. And Councilmember Whalen, uh, the Richfield Foundation volunteered to present at our second meeting in January since we had such a full agenda tonight. Uh, the consent calendar contains several separate items which are acted upon by the City Council in one motion. Once the consent calendar has been approved, the individual items and recommended actions have been also been approved. And on tonight's consent calendar are several items that approve purchases that are funded in the 2021 budget. Um, staff sometimes bid projects just before the funding year to maximize a construction season or to receive new equipment as soon as possible if there are long lead times. I recommend that you move the consent calendar contingent on approval of the budget, which is later on in the agenda, it's item number 26. And bear with me, there are a lot of them. So on tonight's consent calendar, item A, consider a resolution regarding a cooperative agreement and addendum to continue membership in the Hennepin County Violent Offender Task Force. Item B, consider to approve the renewal of the 2021 licenses for on sale 3.2% malt liquor, off sale 3.2% percent malt liquor, secondhand goods dealer, and taxi companies doing business in Rich, Richfield. And that includes uh, a Gold Star Taxi for the taxis. Secondhand goods dealers are GameStop and Wedding Day jeweler, Jewelers. And then the 3.2% malt liquor, there's two La Vaquitas, one Portland Food Mart, Pump and Mudge, Richfield, Minoco, there are four speedways, number 4186, 4188, number 4191, number 4615. Target Corporation, Vienna Restaurant, Pizza Luce. Item C, consider the approval of the purchase of a truck chassis from Nuss Trucking Equipment for $106,953 and dump box snow fighting equipment from Townmaster truck and equipment for $104,971, totaling $211,924 plus taxes and licensing in 2021 for use by the Public Works Department. Item D, consider approval of an amendment to the agreement with the City of Bloomington for the provision of public health services for the City of Richfield for 2021. Item E, consider the adoption of a resolution authorizing Richfield Public Safety police slash police department to accept donations from the listed agencies, businesses, and private individuals for designated uses. Item F, consider the approval of a contract with Graymont LLC for the annual purchase of 1,400 tons of quicklime in the amount of $785,400 for 
for water treatment in 2021, 22, and 23. Consider the approval of a contract, I'm sorry, item G. Consider the approval of a contract with Meyer Contracting in the amount of $715,817.55 for the Woodlake Lift Station Improvement Project. Item H, consider the approval of a contract with Minnesota Dirt Works in the amount of $123,456 for the Christian Pond Dredging Project. And our final, final item, item A, I'm sorry, item I, consider the adoption of a resolution designating polling places for 2021. And again, I recommend uh, approving the consent calendar contingent upon approval of the budget later in the agenda. Thank you, City Manager Rodriguez. Is there a motion to move the consent calendar? Council Member Troutman. Garcia Trout moves the consent calendar. Council Member Troutman, I would second. And Council Member Garcia, um, I just want to clarify that your motion is contingent on the approval of the budget. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. And then the same to you, Council Member Troutman. Great. Um, so the motion has been made by Council Member Garcia, contingent on the approval of the budget uh, following later in the agenda. And the item has been seconded by Council Member Troutman. Are there com uh, comments or questions on the consent calendar from Council Members? Council Member Whalen. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just want to um, note two things. One, with the uh, Woodlake lift station project. Just exciting to see that we've got projects now where our prevailing wage ordinance that we passed earlier this year is applying. And so it's exciting to know that um, we had many bids for that project, but to know that all of them, it's now required that the workers get paid what they deserve. And so that's um, that's good to see. And then the other one, just to note to anyone listening, um, Several of you may have noticed your polling place changed this year, or maybe not if you voted by mail, um, that several of them will be switching back um, and all of that's just related to school construction. So I just would encourage folks to pay attention to where their polling place will be. Thank you, Council Member Whalen. And I'll just add a couple comments um, in response very generally to um, Kathleen Balaban's um, letter uh, re regarding a couple items on the consent calendar. I will say that staff has been working tremendously hard on um, looking for cost savings in every single place possible. Um, staff have deferred projects and um, we have looked, we have worked together um, and over several work sessions and over the past year to make sure that we are doing every single thing possible to have cost savings, spending less money, um, making very hard decisions and deferring projects. And so um, I will just say very generally, um, and we can get more information after staff follows up on all her specific um, requests, but I will say big picture, um, given the situation we're in, we are very conscious of the impact that our community is going through. We have allocated as much of CARES funding as we can to cover both expenses in the city, but also make sure we're supporting um, our residents with food assistance, with rent assistance, our small businesses as well. So. Um, we understand that this this year, and we will continue to have very hard years, I think, for, for a handful of years because of what we're living. Um, but that was a priority, and I think staff did a, a pretty great job in making sure we could find some cost savings. But I know we will um, also send her out a specific response to the various questions she had. Any other comments, Council Member Seppel? I also wanted to draw attention to item D, which was the agreement for the public health services. That is something that we have used extensively this year with the pandemic. And I'm just very grateful that we have an arrangement that we do with the city of Bloomington and Edina and that we all work together on that. So thank you to whoever put that together. Thank you, council member Seppel. Any last comments on the consent calendar? All right, analyst Martinez Gavinia, could you please take the roll call vote? Mayor Regan Gonzalez. Aye. Council Member Supple. Aye. Council Member Troutman. Aye. Council Member Garcia. Aye. Council Member Whalen. Aye. We have five ayes.
Thank you. The consent calendar has been moved. The next item is um, the first item on a long list of public hearings, and that will go to Council Member Supple. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This item is we're going to conduct a public hearing and consider a second reading of an ordinance establishing a nine month moratorium on the development of certain properties in the vicinity of Veterans Park. The moratorium would apply to properties that are guided for medium and high density residential or commercial use in the 2040 Richfield Comprehensive Plan. Veterans Park is an important community asset providing year-round recreational opportunities for Richfield residents and visitors. The 108-acre park includes important facilities like the ice arena, pool, mini golf, and band shell, as well as natural space and the Veterans Memorial. The city's comprehensive plan guides land uses along the edge of the park, along Portland Avenue and 66th Street, as well as a mix of low to high density residential and community commercial but provides no specific guidance for how these parcels relate to the park itself. The American Legion owns a large piece of property that essentially extends into the park. As the Legion prepares to sell this property, staff has begun considering how the redevelopment of this parcel and others nearby could be done in a way that could be complementary to the park, adding value to any potential redevelopment and also to one of the city's most popular destinations. Staff is recommending that the City Council conduct a planning study of the area along Portland Avenue between Highway 62 and 67th Street and 66th Street between 5th Avenue and approximately 11th Avenue. The study would provide an opportunity for additional policymaker and community engagement to better inform redevelopment goals. In order to conduct this study, staff recommends a nine month moratorium on properties with a planned land use designation of medium density residential, high density residential, or community commercial in the 2040 comprehensive plan. Without a moratorium, development could occur in this area that satisfies the minimum, minimum requirements of the zoning code, but does not meet the intent or the long-term goals of the city. The likely outcome of a study would be a recommendation of either zoning modification through adoption of an overlay district, similar to what has been done for Penn Avenue corridor or design guidelines. In either case, the purpose would be to ensure that private and public investment in the park work together for mutual benefit. State law allows cities to adopt interim ordinances for the purposes of protecting the planning process and the health, safety, and welfare of citizens. Although not required by statute, the city is holding this public hearing and has notified affected property owners. If approved, the moratorium may be rescinded at any time. Is there anything that staff would like to add? City Manager Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor. And I'll just ask Community Development Director Stark and Assistant Community Development Director Paleman to jump in at any time if I miss something. Uh, we've received a lot of communication on this issue. Um, thank you. Uh, we have tried to be responsive. Uh, first, I want to say I, we, the city absolutely values the American Legion and thanks all of the members for their service. We do feel we've been working with the Legion on this process. We understood that they needed their time to work through the decisions with their membership. Uh, we're now recommending a process for the city and the community to do their re research and review. In discussions with the Legion real estate broker, they mentioned a development of up to 350 units. That would be a major change for the community in a, in a very lo important location. The moratorium and the small area plan allows policymakers, the community and stakeholders like the Legion and potential developers, the time and space to work towards a development that will be an asset for all. A, mor a moratorium would not stop the American Legion from marketing its property, from negotiating the sale of its property, or even selling it to a developer. It also wouldn't stop a developer from creating a concept plan for the site and working with the city on refining that plan 
as the city is refining their goals for the prop property. Developers have contacted us and stated that they believe that they can make progress during a moratorium. However, staff did hear the message that the Legion members are concerned about the length of the delay. We reviewed our schedule and we've done everything we can to speed it up. We propose that council could shorten the moratorium to seven months. And that's all I have. Thank you, City Manager Rodriguez. Are there other additional items from staff? Otherwise, I'll make a clarification and kind of process and what's next. No, it looks like there's all right. Um, so I know that there's probably a lot of folks for this um, item. So I just want to get really clear on how we move forward. So we keep it as clean as possible. Um, so in terms of the public hearing, we can open up the public hearing. Council member Supple can do that. Um, and then if you know, if council members and staff, a lot of times what happens is there's comments or questions that we can then um, discuss afterwards to the best of our ability. Um, and then we can have our, our council discussion after the public hearing is closed. Um, so if that makes sense, are there any, does that make sense to the council members? Great, yes, council yes. member Supple. So did you want staff to answer the questions while the public hearing is still open or no, after the public no, hearing I think closes? We could just do open and close the hearing and then as, as much as possible, we'll take notes and make sure um, as much as possible council and staff can address any questions that we're able to knowing that, you know, though we're not exactly sure everything that will be asked or brought up in the process. All right. Well, then I would like to open the public hearing. Um, Assistant Wynn, could you explain the number to call into in the process before we begin? Thank you, Council Member Seppel. Yep, uh, residents are more than welcome to participate live in our public hearings tonight. You can call 612-861-0651 to be connected to myself, and I can patch you through uh, when it is your turn to speak for the public hearing. And I do currently have um, Commander Stevens on the line that would like to speak for the post, so I'm going to put uh, put him through. Um, before he begins, I believe, and Mayor Regan Gonzalez can correct me if I'm wrong, each speaker gets three minutes. Is that correct? Yes, we do ask folks to please keep it um, to three minutes. And if we um, have folks that are coming to share their same thoughts, we ask that you really try, if someone already shared, you know, your the same perspective you have, that you try to keep it very short um, so we can kind of get through all of the different perspectives and opinions that folks have versus repeating um, the same thing. All right, thank you. Hello, uh, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here this evening. Um, as mentioned, my name is Adam Siemens. I'm the commander of Post 435. Uh, I've been a resident of Richfield since 2008, where I live on the 6300 block of 12th Avenue South. Uh, in addition to this, I'm a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. Uh, since completing my service in the Marines, uh, I continue to serve uh, my community as a peace officer here in the metro area. Um, tonight, like I said, I'm here speaking as the commander of uh, the Minneapolis Richfield American Legion Post 435. I lead this veteran organization of over 1,400 men and women that, um, throughout our entire history, have provided charitable donations and volunteered hundreds of hours every year to support our Legion mission of serving veterans uh, and community organizations. In addition to representing uh, the Post membership and extended Legion family, I am also representing the many community individuals and families. Uh, they receive support and services from nonprofit, I'm sorry, from the nonprofit organizations that benefit every year from the charitable donations and volunteer hours uh, committed by our post members. This includes nonprofit organizations that, su uh, that support youth initiatives, low income families and individuals, uh, the disabled, the elderly, uh, and our community overall. Post 435, uh, we're 94 years strong right now. We were first chartered in May of 1927. And at our Portland, uh, Portland Ave location. Uh, it's been our home since being inaugurated in 1957. 
We currently have over 1,000 active veteran members and over 400 active extended post family members, which include uh, Sons of the American Legion, the Auxiliary, our Gun Club, our Legion Riders, um, of which over 200 are residents here in the city of Ridgefield. Our current members have service history dating back to World War II, and it also extends through our current conflicts in the Middle East and elsewhere. Post 435 veterans have served our, community, our country proudly through our military service for decades and continue to serve our country and community now as Post 435 Legion members. Um, I've never had a reason uh, to speak before the city council meeting before, uh, as we've always had a very good relationship with the city and its staff. So I think it's unfortunate that I have to speak tonight at this meeting to oppose the city's attempt to impose a development moratorium onto the Post property at a critical point in our Post history. Um, the action you're being asked to take tonight may well determine whether Post 435 remains financially viable and a presence in the city uh, for many years to come. So on behalf of the Post 435 and the community organizations that we support, uh, I strongly urge you to reject the proposed development moratorium. Post 435 has been in regular contact with city staff for months now about its desire to sell and redevelop its property to provide new service facilities and new housing for veterans while also generating funds to help ensure that uh, the long-term viability of the post and its service mission. Um, we have pledged our commitment to follow city policies, including those reflected in the city's 2040 comprehensive plan. We continue to offer our partnership to the city in all aspects of the development of our property. In spite of this, it's been very frustrating that staff never mentioned the need for a moratorium or any, in any of our prior discussions we've had. And we were only made aware of it hours prior to our work session meeting two weeks ago. That's not right. In my opinion reflects, okay. reflects uh, bad faith on the city's part. Excuse me, Commander uh, Siemens. We were, um, yeah, we're coming yeah. towards the end of that three-minute period, so if you could wrap it up shortly, that would be appreciated. Thank you. I, yep, I understand. So basically, the, in conclusion here, um, this moratorium reflects a lack of respect and trust on the city's part and will make future cooperation more difficult to achieve. None of us know what's going to happen the next year, and any delay could be enough for the market for uh, housing to shift or disappear entirely. That would be totally unacceptable outcome for not only our post, but every individual and family that receives services and supports uh, through our organization. Moreover, it's been demonstrated time and time again that if the city is contemplating placing public community facilities on some or all of our post property, you have essentially told the marketplace to stay away. No buyer is going to consider our property for redevelopment with that type of cloud hanging over it. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight, and uh, I'll be remaining on the call uh, for any questions that anybody might have. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Assistant Wynn, are there further other callers? I do have uh, another caller, so I will patch them through. And also, please remember to state your name and your address for the public record. Thank you. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Okay. Um, my name is Patty Ryman. I am calling um, on behalf of my sister, uh, Nancy Lindell, and we have a partner real estate partnership called Arrangements Unlimited. And we own a property at 817 East 66th Street. And we have owned part or all of the property in our family since 1951. Um, we previously built the building um, <clears throat> that stands there now in 1998, and it housed Ritual Floral and Gardens. Currently, our tenant is Local Roots. Um, I'm calling in, um, I would like to reject um, the moratorium. I don't know if you realize, but we have had our property for sale since 2017. 
we've had to endure road construction, removal of large maple trees in our front. Um, when Hennepin County came through, they took 10 feet of our easement property. And now a moratorium on any development on our property, like the Legion commander said, is just a, a red flag for any possible purchase of our property. Um, my sister and I have worked um, in this area for 43 years. We're both graduates of Richfield High School. Um, Richfield has been very, very important. Our parents started um, when Richfield was just developing and we're proud of Richfield, but this new moratorium and is just going to be a complete hardship on our family. We, you know, we are in our 60s, we're seniors, we're retired. We were depending on the sale of the property to support us in our retirement years. And without that now, um, it, it's just gonna be a, a huge hardship to us. Um, and so we are asking that you reconsider or at least eliminate us as a property. We're not even, we're just across the street from Vets Park. We're not even attached to Veterans Park whatsoever. And I don't understand why we would be included in that whole development. We really have nothing to do with it. So um, my phone call to you tonight is we would like um, you to reconsider even adding us to the property and if we could be exempt since we're not even part of it. Um, and if there's any questions, um, I would be happy to answer them. Is that three minutes? Almost exactly. Thank you for your comments. Oh. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. And thank you for your consideration for our family. I'd appreciate it. Are there further callers, Assistant Wynn? I do have uh, another caller on the line, so I'll patch them through. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Peter Coyle. I'm a lawyer with Larkin Hoffman in Bloomington, Minnesota, 8300 Norman Center Drive. I'm the attorney, the land use attorney hired by Post 435 to advise them on this matter and to work with them and the city ultimately on putting their project together. I want to just focus on the element of time. Uh, the city's moratorium of seven to nine months effectively puts the possibility of getting a project started and underway in 2021 at great risk which means we also face a risk of missing a market opportunity that current conditions would allow. The city's comprehensive plan, which it just adopted a year or so ago, presumably and theoretically established the policies that govern the use of this property. So it's unclear to us what additional policy review would be needed that a moratorium would accomplish. And then related to that, even if the policies are all exactly as they need to be, it takes many months to put a development application together to meet the city's exacting uh, subdivision and development requirements. And the city by its own code and by law has up to four months to process that application. So there are multiple opportunities for the city and staff to review the application, to comment on it, to critique it, uh, to offer judgments favorable or not as to whether the application is sound. And in that process, we would expect to cooperate very actively with staff to try to make sure the very best project was brought forward, both for the post, but also for the city. And so while you're considering this moratorium this evening, notwithstanding the recommendation of staff to reduce it to seven months, I would ask you to bear in mind that the timing issue that we are most concerned about would be negatively affected by the moratorium as it's been proposed. Uh, Mayor and, and council, thank you very much for your time. I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your comments. Assistant Wynn, are there further callers? Uh, Council Member Seppel, I do not have anybody else on the line. All right, um, would you, you repeat the phone number one more time in case someone else wants to call in? 
Thank you. Of course. Residents can participate live in our public hearings. You can call 612-861-0651 and you'll be connected to me here in the chambers and I can put you through live to the meeting. So I believe there's about a minute and a half delay from when we speak to when it goes out. So we'll pause for about another minute before we close the hearing in case someone wants to call in. Assistant Wynn, is there anyone else on the line? I do not have any more callers. Um, I will close the public hearing line, but I, I do have another letter to be read, but it, it's hard for me if, if someone were to call in. So if um, you're okay with it, Mayor and Council members, I will uh, close the public hearing line, but I do have another public hearing comment to read if that's all right with you. Thank you. Okay, we did uh, receive a letter that was dropped off um, here at City Council. It was by a Ray Kosky at 2517 West 66th Street, um, speaking on behalf of the American Legion Post 435 moratorium issue. I am a 20 year member of the Richfield American Legion at Post 435, having served our country in the Navy. Um, from 1958 to 1962. I strongly urge you to not adopt the proposed moratorium recommended by your staff regarding the post 435 property at 65th in Portland. I have recently learned that the city of Richfield is considering adopting such a moratorium on any attempt by post 35 to sell and redevelop its property. I understand that the city is considering among other things purchasing the post 435 property for use as public community center, notwithstanding that the property is privately owned. In fact, I am aware that there are several serious potential buyers of the post 435 property who are committed to working with the post leadership to redevelop the property for housing to serve veterans, among others, as well as providing space for regular post 435 activities, such as dining and meeting space. Post 435 needs to have its plans move forward while the market is favorable for a sale on attractive terms with a buyer willing to work with us. Any moratorium imposed by the city will affect Post 435's ability to sell its property for a fair price and could place the continued viability of Post 435 service capacity in serious jeopardy. The Post needs this sale now, not in six to nine months. A moratorium will scare off potential buyers, could bring the price down, and lengthen the time between a sale and when the post can obtain sale pro proceeds to be used for the financial affairs of the post, for its new facilities, to help pay debt, and to further its charitable works and helping the veterans of Richfield and around the area. Thank you for your time and attention to this important matter. And that is all I have for then for the public hearing comments. Thank you, Assistant Wynn. I would move to close the public hearing. Councilmember Whalen, I'll second. Thank you. The motion has been made by Councilmember Supple to close the public hearing and seconded by Councilmember Whalen. Any comments or questions um, regarding the public hearing before we move to the discussion? 
All right. Oh, um, yes, Director Stark. Uh, would you like staff to address any of the uh, topics that came up? Yes, I'll close. I'll finish closing the public oh, hearing. Sorry, I thought that had been no, no, that's fine. Um, any comments from folks? Sounds like none. All right. Um, so if analyst Martinez Gavinia, you could please take the roll call vote so we could close the public hearing. Mayor Rita Gonzalez. Aye. Council Member Supple. Aye. Council Member Chapman. Council Member Garcia. Aye. Council Member Whalen. Aye. We have five ayes. Thank you. The public hearing has been closed. Um, now we can move to the part where if um, staff could respond to any of the com comments or questions that were brought up and then we will you know, have a, a discussion with the council among the council as well. Director Stark. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and sorry for being out of order. Um, yeah, I just had a few comments to make. Um, Commander Siemens, uh, and I, so I want to kind of repeat what you heard from City Manager Rodriguez, that staff is intent on being um, helpful to the Legion and to prospective developers as they pursue this. Um, we don't think that a moratorium needs to um, needs to stop the development process. Uh, it certainly um, it certainly puts a pause on certain aspects of it. Uh, but Commander Siemens had uh, stated his concern, and I understand the concern that no buyer would consider the site while it was under a moratorium um, to date. Uh, I've spoken with three specific uh, developers that have expressed interest in the site, um, and then uh, a, a few kind of calls that um, that I think were were getting to that place, uh, but weren't as specific. So there there could be as many as you know five developers that are pursuing this. Um, in the conversations I've had with them. I don't believe that a moratorium would um, would halt their interest, uh, and I don't believe that it would um, have them put on the brakes for a full seven or nine months. I believe that this is something staff and a developer could work with during the moratorium. Um, and again, so, some of the conversations I've had with uh, prospective developers have, have been since the first reading occurred with the knowledge of a potential moratorium. And it it sounded to me like uh, perhaps a moratorium, it'd be preferred not to have it, but it, that it was not any kind of a, uh, a killer to their proposal. Uh, and in, you know, in my tenure with Richfield since 1998, I believe this would be the third moratorium I've been a part of uh, for the prior two, one was on 77th Street around the Nicolet area, and one was on Penn Avenue. In both of these moratoriums, we did work with developers while the mor moratorium was in place, and development happened uh, almost instantaneously uh, upon the uh, cessation of the moratorium because uh, we, we and the developers got them to a place where they were able to apply very quickly. Um, Mr. Coyle, uh, the attorney for the Legion, uh, had a couple of good questions. Uh, you know, he stated that we we had just adopted our comprehensive plan, uh, you know, less than a year ago or 18 months ago, uh, and that's true. Uh, and so he, his question was, what additional policy review might be necessary? You know, our comprehensive plan is generalized. Uh, it, it takes in the whole city. There are many area, many distinct sub areas of the city, city where we have small area plans or overlay districts. Uh, Penn Avenue is one. Seventy seventh Street is one. Um, there are others, and so it's normal for us to have kind of two layers to our planning. 
One is the very broad, comprehensive planning that covers the entire city. And the second is a more specific look at a, at a smaller district or corridor. So this is not unusual uh, for us to do it. Uh, you know, I wish, uh, I wish we had been a little uh, further ahead uh, and had this done, uh, but we don't. The other issue is right now our comprehensive plan and our zoning ordinance don't say exactly the same thing. Uh, and Minnesota state statute requires that that be the case. Uh, through this process, we'd like to bring the two into compliance. Uh, that's something that we're intent on doing. Uh, finally, uh, Mr. Coyle said many months to put an application together, and that's true. Uh, you know, I again, I'm, I'm going to offer you my opinion. If a developer called me tomorrow and said, I have a signed purchase agreement with the American Legion, and you were to ask me, absent a moratorium, when I thought that that would come to you uh, for consideration of planning and zoning approvals on a site this big, I would I would think six months um, would be pretty aggressive. Um, and so, again, if we're able to work with a developer during the moratorium, even if they're ready to go tomorrow, I, I believe that when the moratorium rolls off, we would be ready to, um, to bring policymakers the, um, whatever approvals are needed from a planning and zoning perspective. So again, I, I just don't see the moratorium and a good development progressing in the next nine months as being mutually exclusive. I think that they can occur simultaneously. Thank you. Thank you, Director Stark. Uh, other comments, questions from council members that we have? Council member Whalen and then council member Supple. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a few thoughts and imagine this will be a robust discussion. So I'll say a couple and then we can circle back. I think the, the main thing I would add um, just to echo uh, Director Stark's comments that I actually, this is the first time anything like this has happened in my two years on council, but I had a director or a, sorry, a developer reach out to me directly today um, just to say that they were one of the people that's been working with the Legion, that they um, essentially what Director Stark just said, that they uh, it's easier without a moratorium, but that that wouldn't be an immediate, like, we need to walk away from it. And I think the, um, my understanding of where this developer was at, which is not all developers, and I understand that there are um, multiple that have been uh, working with the Legion. Um, his biggest question, and I, I think personally my biggest question that I know we are working on making the quickest part of this process is this question of how much, if at all, does the city want to or is able to um, financially be part of any project um, on the spectrum of some people have asked about full on buying the property um, and building a community center, which uh, to the Legion's point, it is it's their private property. They can decide who they sell it to. Um, but that that that's a question that's been raised. Um, I personally am less. Um, I think it's worth asking. I'm less. Uh, optimistic that there's any realistic plan toward that, even if the Legion was open to that. But I think what I'm most excited about, and it sounds like um, I haven't been in the discussions with the Legion, but from my understanding of their discussions with staff over the last few months, um, certainly this developer that I talked to, um, that the, well, I know for a fact the Legion is hoping to have some type of development that still has space for them to keep meeting there. Um, which I think is a great goal and very possible. Um, my goal and this developer's goal, and I think uh, several community members I've talked to, um, is that this could be an opportunity to have more community space, that we as a 
city don't have many places that people can rent space indoors to bring in food and have a birthday party or a graduation party or that kind of thing. And um, whether it's that or other city amenities, I think um, the bigger question I'm interested in is around um, could the city contribute some, and we'd have to figure out the amount or what this even looks like, to make some community amenity spaces possible. Um, and hopefully then that money would make the development more feasible. If it is indeed gonna include some housing for veterans, that that could be made more deeply affordable for the veterans who are to move in there, um, whatever that looks like. That I think there's, that question is, I think the quickest part of this process um, that staff I know are committed to, um, to getting the research done that is needed around that. And then council, I believe our commitment is to on, uh, in the first uh, council meeting of January to make a decision around that based on that research. And so my understanding is that if we, within almost exactly a month from now, can get a much clearer answer of like what is the big picture direction for this site and is the city interested in putting in um, a proposal or bid ourselves um at least this one developer i talked to his he seemed to say that beyond that um once if if the decision were for the city to not consider even proposing um a full purchase of the site that beyond that, he would be happy to just be in the discussions and uh, like Director Stark was proposing that could be part of those decisions um, or at least aware of them that those would be fully transparent to be able to be planning as we go. So anyway, that was that was a lot, but I that is informing some of um, some of where I'm coming from um, that the it can this is not preventing them. I know it. I'm not gonna be naive. I know this is going to discourage some buyers, but I don't think it will discourage all of them. Um, and then the other thing that I was gonna say, just that I, the developer, really all developers are interested in, um, and we strongly encourage them to hold, and most of them do hold community engagement sessions that I think the small area plan process would do a lot of that kind of community engagement, that it would be like built in that they would have the developer or multiple developers if there are potential ones and multiple of them want to be part of the process, that they can all be in those community engagement sessions, um, hearing what the neighbors want, what the community members, how they want it to relate to the memorial that's right next door, the ice arena that's right next door, the park as a whole. Um, so I think that community engagement piece is is key, and that given um, what all I would also agree with Director Stark that I, it obviously would have been better if we had made an, a small area plan or an overlay district or something if we had known to do that years ago great but we don't have that and i think we need that and just uh as um uh sorry blanking on words um as was stated earlier the the option that right now the current zoning because it is for citywide that this could be uh 350 400 units i i'm very excited about the idea of housing being part of this but I, I think if we have a tall apartment building or a tall office building, if that were a, a possible, like there's certain things that don't fit here. And that currently a, like having a tall apartment building shadowing a memorial is just not a good fit. And so I think taking the time to do our community engagement and process with um, among city staff and the council and the community and the legion and any potential developers to figure out like what is the best use for this land and for the land in other potential 
development areas for the future around the park, um, that that's really essential. And I by far used up more time than I should have, so I'll let others discuss now. Thank you, Council Member Whalen. I don't know if staff have any responses to any of the comments Council Member Whalen had before we go to Council Member Supple. Well, I would really just agree um, with with everything uh, we heard from Council Member Whalen, especially the notion of, uh, you know, when we do get into the specifics of what this plan will address, some of the design issues, some of the performance issues. Um, Two things. One is we would like to have the developers at the table. Uh, you know, it's nice to have some real world uh, practicality applied to to what we're discussing. Uh, and number two, uh, that discussion is going to happen no matter what, with the community uh, and with the council and with the planning commission. Um, when it happens late in the process. It's much more divisive. Uh, it's much more um, combative. When it happens early in the process, uh, it is. It's a much always a much smoother process in the end. And um, the folks that are experienced developers out there understand that and uh, appreciate that role we're taking. Uh, so uh, that's all I would comment on. Uh, Councilmember Whalen's words. Thank you, Director Stark. And I saw Director Markle had her hand up as well. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I would just like to to say I agree with Councilmember Whelan's comments. Um, as the Recreation Services Director, you know some of our parks and green spaces are more sensitive than others. Veterans Park would definitely be one of our more sensitive parks. You know, in a sense, it's a huge wetland. It takes on a large percentage of our stormwater runoff. Um, we have our beautiful Veterans Memorial. You know, it's home to hundreds of bird species and plants, and it's a very beloved park um, by quite a few residents that will definitely fight to protect um, and preserve what, what we have there. And so I think whatever goes into this space, you know, taking the time, as Director Stark said, on the front end to, to develop um, standards and that kind of are in sync in being in this space with the park and the green space um, and having that community buy-in and having um, builders comments and feedback as well and just bringing more people to the table to discuss what makes sense for this space um, would be you know a smart thing to do and prudent on the front end like he said versus later in the, the process. Thank, thank you, Dr. Markle. Um, Council Member Supple, I know you had some comments and questions. Um, well, first, I would like to ask staff a question. Um, you responded to Commander Siemens and the attorney for the Legion, but there was no response to the woman who spoke, who was a landlord, landowner along 66th Street. So could you please talk about why the area that was set aside was set aside and respond to her concerns about having her property as part of this issue or part of this moratorium. Yep, um, Assistant Director Paleman. Thank you, I'll try and address that. Um, as part of this study, we went back and looked at the last time we looked at the corridor along 66th Street, and that was our 2011 study that was in advance of the reconstruction of the road. Um, one of the outcomes of that study is that we should um, look at all of the uses that are um, park adjacent and in that corridor near the park and think about how our regulations can guide them to partner with the park, to have uses that are complementary to the park, to use materials that um, uh, mesh well with what is happening on the natural side of the street. And so when we um, started thinking about what's happening north of 66 with the Legion property and the other commercial properties at that corner, it naturally made sense to wrap that around uh, the south end of the park as well. So that's why that is included there. All right, and then 
I assume that the same thing would go that you'd be willing to work with any buyers or developers that are interested in that property as well. Yes, absolutely. Okay, um, I'm. I had a few comments just in general. Um, there are several competing interests here that need to be considered. Um, the Legion is a valued part of our community, and we wish to continue working with them. Veterans Park is a valued asset to our community, and it's enjoyed by many residents, and it needs to be protected. And the city needs to consider many other factors, including appropriate zoning and the comprehensive plan, land use, and what is financially feasible. Commander Siemens has stated that the posts wish to work with the city or and or a new developer. And I would like to see a partnership moving forward that balances all of those competing interests. The moratorium allows us to do this thoughtfully and carefully. However, I'm also advocating that it be done in a timely manner so that post 35 and the other businesses can proceed along with their businesses and move on with their plans. So it's my understanding that a moratorium can be lifted early or altered um, as need to be. And so I'd like the staff to continue working with the Legion as we go through this process. And I'd like to hear more about what would happen if we would switch to seven months. Thank you. City Manager Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor and Council Member Supple. Um, thank you for your questions. So I talked to Director Markle, Director Stark, and Assistant uh, Director Paleman about this today. And we looked at that process to try and speed it up as much as possible. Um, I know that after the last meeting, Director Markle and I were on the phone that next day trying to put together an outline for the research we needed to do to present to you. We also moved that meeting up. Originally, I was we were presented the second meeting in January. We moved it up to the first meeting in January so that we can present whether there is a financially feasible uh, path to purchasing and building a community center. Um, Director Merkel's uh, gone to her colleagues to pull different uh, partnerships that other cities have used to build community centers, what the financing would look like and what the timeline would look like. And so we hope to bring that to you early in the process and get a decision or guidance on that. Also to explore the possibility of partnering in a future development, which would have a smaller footprint, smaller cost, shorter timeline. Uh, so I, I do appreciate uh, the staff making this a priority. I mean, Director Markle right now is also spearheading the organized collection. We're all working on our response to COVID. Um, so I, I really do appreciate staff trying to work with the Legion. We did take them seriously. I know they're still disappointed with our, our process, but we are trying. Thank you, City Manager. Director Stark? Yeah, I would just add that, you know, once we, we talked about this last uh, two weeks ago being kind of a two step process. The first step really uh, delving into the community center and what the capacity uh, financially of the city to participate in one and what the needs and desire of the community are uh, for a community center. And, uh, you know, that's not really a community development thing. So, uh, you know, I would let um, Director Markle and City Manager Rodriguez uh, discuss that more. But the, the next step then would be the small area plan. And uh, we can get that done um, in six months, definitely, um, maybe maybe five, um, if we really tried. Uh, the problem with compressing that too much is the really the most time consumptive part of that process is the public engagement. And we don't want to limit that. Um, that's the last thing we'd like to limit. Um, but. We do believe we can get this done in that time frame, and you know, really, what we're hearing from the legion and what we've heard from some developers is, at this point, with the discussions happening from the city and the moratorium, you know, there's uh, there's a a measured amount of uncertainty. I think that every every step in the process that goes by uh, will decrease the amount of uncertainty and let the developers looking at the property 
feel more comfortable with expending resources on a proposal. And so, for example, if we know more in, in four, six, eight weeks about a community center uh, or what kind of community space we're talking about, that eliminates a great deal of uncertainty uh, um, from process. And so, again, during the moratorium process, as we get closer to the end of it, we will be working more directly with the developers, with the brokers, with the property owner, uh, and uh, in getting this thing moving forward. Thank you, Director Stark. Other comments? Um, let's see. I just want to go to before we go to Council Member Willen, I want to make sure that other folks, um, other Council Members who haven't spoken up, Council Member Troutman or Garcia, um, any comments that you'd like to share? Well, Mayor. Yep, um, Hi, Council Member Garcia. You know, I, I think everybody, you know, all the council and, and the city staff are are really on the same page. And while we recognize, you know, the, the financial burden that this will be on the Legion, we also appreciate the Legion. And we, we're not, what, what we want to do is we want to hopefully some, we can, have a vision enough to form some type of a partnership with either another governmental entity or or with um, or with uh, like the YMCA or the Boys and Girls Clubs or 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 um, maybe maybe even I even suggested that maybe the MAC would want to would want to uh, have office space there, but. Um, I think we're not, we, we really, this is such an open opportunity for us. And it's an opportunity that we can't pass up, but you have to have community buy-in. And when Mr. Stark said, we can't limit um, the public engagement, that's true. We cannot do that because if we do, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna run into uh, a lot more difficulties. This is a great opportunity for the city. It's a great opportunity if we all work together towards that same goal, because this is such a beautiful, beautiful park. It is the park. It is the best park. It has got so many amenities to it. Um, we cannot, we can, we've got to find something that fits in that will will be adequate enough to fit into that park and that will work well with the uh, surrounding amenities of that park. So I just, I just, uh, um, I just want to encourage us to, to just, you know, um, do whatever we can to ask other people to, to look around, to to just do some homework and see what the possibility is that we can really make something something productive, something that's efficient and progressive happen there. And, and that doesn't that includes working with uh, the Legion. So we've got to put our our, our caps on and, and start and start believing in the process and making things happen. That's it. Thank you, Thank you Council Member Garcia. Um, Council Member Troutman, do you have any comments? Thank you, Mayor Reagan Gonzalez. And, um, and I wanna thank uh, specifically all the community members uh, that, um, that reached out this week. Um, specifically, I wanna thank uh, Shirley Pop and Dean Sturgis and Patrick Rickett and uh, Dwayne uh, Callis and uh, my friend Mike from Herbalife uh, in, uh, on Penn Avenue, uh, who are all members of the Legion, but have also uh, served, our, served our country and uh, served with honor and distinction. And one of my favorite things in the Legion, there's a banner in the conference room that has stars. It's a sewn banner, it's a more than a hundred years old and it has stars for every North uh, Heist High school graduate that um, that was that died or, or was injured in World War One, 
and um, I think we just we can't we can't talk about folks who serve like this without talking about how fo folks have served our country. And uh, so I just want to say thank you for that. Um, uh, with uh, and um, and I had I had initially some some concerns about about the moratorium, but as as I as I've learned more about it and learned the scope just potentially incredible scope of some of these developments um, to provide affordable housing for veterans um, and and do a lot of great things and keep uh, keep the um, um, the uh, the legion um, viable um, in into into generations to come these are all incredible um, I think I could just other my colleagues have said it more eloquently than I can but I think we if we were to to not take the time to engage uh, our community, especially where there's a gap between our comprehensive plan and our zoning, and um, and we were to, we were to not do this, I think I think we'd be remiss not to seek that community uh, involvement and engagement. I appreciated uh, also hearing from um, from a developer this afternoon who said they were they were not at all scared off by this this moratorium. In fact, they said we have. We have a, a letter of intent that we've already put down in front of uh, in front of the, the legion, and they're very eager uh, to to uh, to move forward in this process. And like I think other people have said, they have an interest in being a part of the conversation. I'm exceedingly interested in having developers a part of this conversation because it keeps anything that we discuss exceedingly practical. So we're not talking about what might be uh, years down the road, but what we need to do right now in the coming weeks and um, on the on the purchasing and cost participation side i'm very glad to know we're going to be able to um, resolve that in weeks not months that's that's really important because i i would feel much more uncomfortable about this moratorium if it was just for us to have an internal conversation about our that would seem to be exceedingly unfair to the legion um and but that's not what we're doing that's something we're going to resolve in, in weeks not months and that's not the purpose of the moratorium the, mo the purpose as i understand it is really to to provide clarity uh for for everybody for a development that's going to be uh potentially larger and right next to an incredible community resource um that we have uh and so uh i i, I plan to support the moratorium i would say there this this issue of the communication of when this was raised and how this was communicated um the the government never gets the benefit of the doubt when there's a miscommunication um and so i i regret that that there is there's now um a a gap of trust that we need to we need to continue to to work to to close um and but but um, irrespective of that, I'm really glad uh, to support this. I'm, well, I'm glad. I'm glad that that this project's moving forward. I'm sorry for the delay, but I I do plan to support the moratorium. Thank you, Council Member Troutman. Um, and I'll just add a few comments. I think a lot of um, where I'm at is where my colleagues are as well. I will be supporting the moratorium. Um, and I just want to speak to the comments that was made by Commander Siemens around um, the expression that this is a, the, a lack of respect and trust on behalf of the city. Um, I just want to reiterate that this is absolutely not uh, a something about lack of respect and trust um, between the city and the legion we highly value the role that the legion has played in our city and if it was not for the veterans in our community we wouldn't have the richfield that we have today and we wouldn't be known for the amazing veterans park that we have and we highly value the legion um, and we absolutely respect you and i think sometimes what happens is um the city has to, we are accountable for taking many things into account. And as council member Supple said, there's competing priorities sometimes. And in, in this situation, I actually don't even know that there are competing priorities outside of a mismatch that's not that big in terms of um, a time and in, in, in a gap in time. And I am very confident that we will continue to do everything we can to be working alongside the Legion. Um, there was a question about uh, reconciling this um, interest in the city buying the property and uh, doing a community center. And my understanding is in terms of the timeline, 
This is something that staff will present to us at the very next meeting with sufficient information to the council to make a clear, decisive decision on that and, and other options so that we can um, either have that as a strong consideration based on what staff bring to us or get it off the table and make sure that we can expedite and keep moving forward with, with other options. So I just want to confirm with staff that, that that's the way that I've understood that, that, that um, Discussion will happen at our very next meeting. Is that correct, city manager? Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, so, again, I just I want to continue building the trust with the Legion. I want to express that the, our city staff and our council highly respect um, and that respect the Legion. And we have to do our due diligence and think about all of these different um considerations thinking about the impact on the legion but thinking about the park thinking about the next 20 30 40 50 years for our community and that's such an important space um, that will have a role in what the future of our community looks like and ensuring that we have a process that we are working in partnership with our stakeholders including the developer including that that you choose and work with including your members and including our residents and the users of that space um, so I just want to make sure that that, you know, we absolutely respect you and I am very confident that we can move forward together and meet the needs and the interests of the Legion and come out with a much stronger project when we're working on this together and that that I truly believe this is the path forward um, to make it happen. And I really look forward to continued conversations on this issue. Are there other comments from council members or staff? Council Member Whalen. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, quick question for staff um, in the, and I trust, I know we've been doing a lot of work around how do we expedite this. Um, for the small area plan process, um, is it true if I remember correctly from last meeting that we have already identified who would be helping lead that? Sorry, directors. Yes, uh, we have. We've identified the firm of Hoisington Kobler Group Incorporated. Uh, we we talked to several firms. Uh, we got uh, proposals from two, uh, but staff, uh, it's our um, recommendation to use Hoisington Kobler for several reasons. Uh, two big reasons are they were the consultants that helped us with our comprehensive plan. And they were also the consultants that helped uh, Director Markle and the Recreation Services and Community Services Commission with the Parks Master Plan. Uh, and so they have both urban planners and park planners on staff. Uh, we think that's a good fit. It falls uh, within the staff's purview of cost uh, for staff uh, acceptance. So I was planning on accepting it without bringing it back to council. Okay, thank you. And specific to that plan, you you talked about um, kind of the the way that the uncertainty is a gradual decrease, and it's not like a whole bunch of unknowns until the day that it's done. Um, I think uh, aside from what many of us have talked about the the city conversation on um, in early January, I think the other big uncertainty is the possibility of changing from it's currently like listed for high density housing um the possibility of a lower density or mixed use or even a different designation is that i know that's a, a bigger discussion that probably needs a lot of the community input is that piece of it something that would be resolved like a couple months in or is that something that we wouldn't know until the end Thank you, uh, Council Member Whalen. Because the comprehensive plan is so new, and that is the use that was uh, identified there, uh, that's the presumption, that's the starting place that staff is presuming we're at. Uh, and we would want to hear fairly quickly if that is incorrect. Um, you know, I would note that to change the comprehensive plan, uh, designation for that from, um, I believe it's, um, give me a second, I've got it written down here, high density residential, 
uh, to change that to anything else would require a four fifth supermajority of the council. Uh, there are very few decisions that the council makes that require a supermajority. So that's a, a high bar to, to achieve. And again, we, we'd want to get some indication fairly early on whether that is um, something contemplated being changed. Having said that, and uh, Assistant Director Paleman has much more expertise in these matters than I do, but the the language in a comprehensive plan and the language in a zoning ordinance purposely don't 100% reflect each other. And so something being identified as high density residential in the comprehensive plan, it's possible that there is some uh, variances, variations in what the zoning could ultimately look like, um, whether that's, um, and before I, stick my foot too far in my mouth, I'd want to uh, maybe pass it along to Assistant Director Paleman. Thank you, members of the council. Uh, I'll give you an example to illustrate what Director Stark is talking about. So right now, the, that property is guided for high density residential. There are two existing zoning districts in the community that would generally accommodate that kind of guidance. There's a high density residential MR3 district. There's also our mixed use community district. So right off the bat, there are two options for the rezoning of this property. In each of those districts, there are bulk and dimensional regulations. So there are things that establish maximum height limitations, setbacks, things like that. So when you start applying a density, but then layering on top of it, the regulations of the zoning, while there's a wide um, range in the comprehensive plan for the density of this property, the way that it's zoned will narrow that, um, that range. Uh, for instance, the mixed use neighborhood zoning district allows up to eight stories. I don't think that the community is going to want us to adopt um, a mixed use neighborhood designation for this property it would obviously allow the highest density. However, if we would look at the um, high density residential MR3, there are other issues that I, I don't think the community is going to be supportive of, although the height limit is less. But again, that's gonna change the range of housing units, what they look like, how that, um, how that development relates to the park. Those are really critical things that we want to look at here, and that's that's the purpose of this moratorium in this area. And I would just add, you know, we don't know what exactly what the outcome will be, uh, but I suspect it could be um, an overlay zone, for example. Uh, an overlay zone is really kind of a custom zoning district. It's taking an existing zoning district that we have and tweaking it, and so as uh, Assistant Director Pellman says there are some aspects of of one zoning district that make more sense than the other, uh, but within that, uh, because of its unique situation next to the park, uh, may not make sense, uh, and that's the very reason we go through this exercise. Why we think it's so important, uh, and why the developers we've talked to think it's so important too. Okay, thank you. That is very helpful. And then my last comment um, is just to say that in in getting uh, comments about this matter from Legion members, um, it became clear to me that the and I I don't know if there is I doubt there is one place to lay blame. I'm not interested in doing that. But I think just a, a learning for us as the city um, in partnership with the Legion throughout this process going forward, um, it seems clear to me that some of, and I almost hesitate to say this because having been part of organizations, you can communicate things as much as you want and people are still going to miss parts of it. Um, but just that I had several really wonderful conversations with Legion members who just didn't have all of the information yet. Um, and I remember one specifically commented, um, they phrased it something like, I, 
I understand that. And I am a Legion member and a community member. And so I see like both of those interests. And so I think um, it just that this is, this is more complex that I don't think this is an us versus them situation that there's competing interests. And I think, uh, just would urge all of us as we move forward to obviously um, the largest amount of communication is going to continue to be with uh, Legion leadership. Um, but as much as we can to, to create routes to inform the, the full Legion membership as well and make sure that they get a voice in the full process, um, I think really enhance this as a whole. Thank you, Council Member Whalen, Director Stark. Yeah, I think that's a great comment. And my my only addition to that to um, the Legion and Legion members that may be out there, as uh, Councilman Whalen uh, said, there are some competing interests. However, I think that the number of shared interests vastly outnumber the competing interests. And that's really the, the point of optimism here, uh, that we really, uh, our self-interest um, from the city standpoint, the Legion self-interest and the developer self-interest have so much overlap. And I think we can, uh, and, and our, our parks, I think that there's so much that can be accomplished here. Uh, I'm really excited about this project. I'm really excited about what it can mean for, um, you know, we've, we've talked about Veterans Park, but it's really a park campus. And, and we haven't treated, well, we haven't talked about it tonight like a campus. We talk about the individual components. Uh, my hope is that when this is all done, that the components of the park, the development um, are all just um, working in concert with each other and is one harmonious site. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Director Stark. Council Member Seppel. Adding on to that, I also want to make sure we listen to all the other small business owners along 66th Street in Portland there too, that, that it encompasses the whole area and gets feedback from everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments or questions from council members? All right. Is there a motion that anyone would like to make? I'll move the moratorium, Councilmember Troutman. I'll second it, Garcia. Thank you. The motion has been made by Councilmember Troutman and seconded by Councilmember Garcia. Councilmember oh, Whalen. Oh, did we do a processing here? I was just going to point a clarification um, because the the seven month moratorium was on the table. Just want to ask Simon, uh, Councilmember Troutman, to uh, state. Okay which he's intending. No, thank you, Council Member Whalen. I was actually just, just about to say that too. Just to, just to be clear, I'm, I'm moving, we have the two options. I would move uh, a seven month moratorium. Great, so the motion has been made by Council Member Whalen, or Council Member Troutman, excuse me, to approve a second reading of the attached ordinance establishing a seven month moratorium. Um, on the development of the properties in the vicinity of Veterans Park that are guided for medium or high density residential or commercial use in the 2040 comprehensive plan. And then the motion has been seconded by council member. Well, Garcia. Wait a minute, Mayor. Mayor. Yep. I, I wanted, what I wanted to second was the nine month the moratorium. And if we can do it earlier, that's fine. But I think we should consider that and then, and then, um, if, you know, we can terminate it earlier. That's fine. But I, I don't think we, we want to have enough wiggle room. Okay, so I just want to check in with staff on process. So the motion has been made for the 7 months. Um, so do I ask if there's a 2nd for the 7 month and, and then we take a vote on that or how does that. Hi, City Attorney Tijan. Thank you for jumping in. Hi, um, Mayor and Council. I, I think if the intention was of the maker of the motion for the seven months, um, now that that's on the table, then I think you should 
seek a second on that motion and vote. And then um, if it does not pass, there could be another motion after that. Thank you. So is there a second on the initial seven month moratorium vote? Council member Whelan? Yes, I'll second. Thank you. Additional comments or questions on the motion um, from council members before we take a vote. Council member Troutman. Thank you, Mayor. And um, and I, I would would welcome any of uh, staff's comments, but based on what I understood from um, uh, City Manager Rodriguez, uh, staff had 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 looked at the process and they understood the circumstances and had worked hard, but felt confident they could get this process done. And I think uh, Director Stark even said within five months, which seems really, really aggressive, um, but shooting shooting for seven months, I just wanna give staff an opportunity to to maybe speak into this, you know, whether they feel like they could get things done in, uh, in seven months or not. And then maybe as a follow-up question, would we have the option to extend it further if we needed to? Director Stark. Uh, just speaking to the duration of the moratorium uh, and just clarify um, what I had said, the the second part of the process uh, involving the small area plan, I, I believe we could get that done in five to six months. Uh, and so really it, it just depends on how long the first part of the process takes. Uh, having said that, um, you know, we'll work with whatever um, time frame you give us. I believe we can make it work within seven months. Uh, I think anything less than that would be untenable, undoable. Um, yes, so I just wanted to clarify. Well, excuse me, um, um, Mayor. Yep, go um, ahead, Council Member Garcia. Director Stark, um, you didn't really, I think, answer the question, but can it be extended if necessary? Yeah, and if maybe I could ask uh, the attorney teaching to address that she might have more expertise in that. Thank you. Uh, Mayor and Council, yeah, the state statute does allow for an extension of a moratorium. Um, and so that would be a possibility. There's certain conditions that would need to be met and certain time restrictions on it. But um, it is it is a, a possible um, option. Okay. With that being said, then I will second uh, uh, Council Member Troutman's motion. Thank you, Council Member Garcia. But we already have a motion and a second by Council Member Whalen, so that is not necessary. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Any additional comments from Council Members before we take a roll call vote? on the seven month moratorium. All right, um, Analyst Martinez Gavinia, could you please take the roll call vote? Mayor Regan Gonzalez. Aye. Council Member Sopel. Aye. Council Member Troutman. Aye. Aye. Council Member Garcia. Aye. Council Member Whalen. Aye. We have five ayes. Thank you, the motion has been approved. Um, and I look forward to working with the Legion and continuing our partnership on this project. Thank you. The next item is goes to Council Member Garcia. Thank you, Mayor. This is, um, this is a public hearing and we're uh, looking to approve the renewal of 2021 club on sale intoxicating and Sunday liquor license for the Fred Babcock Post BFW, uh, otherwise known as the four fives at 6715 Lakeshore Drive. All the required information that public safety needs uh, and, and documents have been provided now, um, because of the COVID-19 um, and the recognition, you know, that, that there's been a financial hardship to these uh, organizations, clubs, or businesses, um, it, um, the, the, the fee has been reduced, the license fee has been reduced, and the deadline to pay 
has been extended by 90 days. So I will uh, I will open it to the public to the public if they want to speak. Mayor, do you want more information? Nope. I was just going to ask um, Assistant Wynn if um, anyone was here to speak. Oh, looks like. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, we did invite um, the VFW to come speak for their public hearing, but they were unable to attend tonight. Okay, and I just saw a hand up from Miguel Hernandez. Um, would you like to speak in the public hearing for the VFW, Miguel? No? Oh, okay. I think that was a no. And I currently do not have anybody on the line for this public hearing. Council member yeah, Oh, you're on mute. There was a question that was asked about if we know the new total and that's referring to the 20% reduction. The person that asked talking? the question might want to clarify. Talking talking about, about, Mayor, this is this is Jennifer Anderson. Um, the the total for uh, the club license, I believe, I don't have the figures in front of me, but I want to say it's less than, um, actually, I think it's $690 for the year for 2021. That includes the, the reduction that we provided. Council member Whalen. Um, just process wise, um, and since we are in the middle of a public hearing, I was wondering if assistant Wynn could just repeat the phone number again, um, in case people had not been tuned in when we said it earlier. Thank you. Certainly council member Whalen. Um, residents are able to participate during our public hearings and you can call 612-861. 0651 to be passed through live to the meeting. I um, mean, just so council is aware, we did extend invites uh, to all of the business owners that were applying for liquor license. And we we're hoping that um, anybody that would like to would attend the meeting, but we do understand that if people need to call in, that is um, completely fine as well. I see a hand up um, from Miguel Hernandez. Are other folks having difficulty in hearing Miguel? Yes, yeah. I am. Yeah, we can't hear you. It's like a phone. I think it's a phone thing, not a mask. Let's see, a connectivity issue. No, you could put it in the chat, possibly. I would, sorry. Go ahead, Council Member Whelan. Um, I would, if we don't have anyone on this item, I would go ahead and move that we close the public hearing, knowing that we've got several more for yes. additional establishments yep. coming up. Yep. I just want to confirm with Miguel that your comments are not for the VFW. Is that correct, Miguel? Yes. Okay. All right, so um, council member Whalen has closed the public hearing. Is there a second motion to close the public hearing? I'll make it all seconded. All right, the motion has been made by council member Whalen and seconded by council member Garcia to close the public hearing. 
Um, now, is there a motion to approve the renewal of the license? Yes, and I just wanted to mention, Mayor, that real you know, this is what what um, uh, staff investigates when when they're when they're uh, asked for a liquor license, and um, and all the real estate taxes are current and have been paid. The proof of liquor liability insurance coverage has been received showing Integrity Insurance Company affording coverage. Workers' compensation insurance has also been supplied. Due to the fact, uh, let me see, due to the fact that they, they are exempt due to the fact that they are a veterans organization club. They are exempt from meeting the code requirement that states that more than 50% of business activities must be related to the service of food. And the environmental health staff has received no complaints regarding uh, the four fives. And, uh, and so uh, uh, there's every reason why uh, we should definitely support this issue. So I will move that we approve the renewal of 2021 club on sale and Sunday liquor license along with a 20% intoxicating liquor license, club license fee reduction with a payment due no later than January the 30th, 2021 for Babcock post 5555. Um, excuse me, Mayor. Council Member Whalen. We have not actually voted to close the public hearing. Oh, we. We just got a motion and a second. The, yeah, oh. we need to take the roll call vote. You're right. Okay. Um, okay. Thank Sorry. You. Nope. Thank you so much, Council Member Whalen. Analyst Martinez Gavinia, could you please take the roll call vote to close the public hearing? Mayor Regan Gonzalez. Aye. Council Member Supple. Aye. Council member. Aye. Council member Garcia. Aye. Council member Whalen. Aye. We have five ayes. Thank you. The public hearing has been closed. Um, and then the motion has been made by council member Garcia. Is there to approve the renewal of the license? Is there a second? Council member Troutman second. Council member Troutman has seconded the motion. Are there questions or comments from council member? A, nope, all right. Um, Analyst Martinez Gavinia, could you please take the roll call vote? Mayor Regan Gonzalez. Aye. Council member Supple. Aye. Council member Troutman. Aye. Council member Garcia. Aye. Council member Whalen. Aye. We have five eyes. Thank you. The motion has been approved. All right, so we are done with that item. Sorry about that. Um, the next items are items number nine through 17, and those will go to Council Member Whalen. Thank you, Mayor. The next nine staff reports are for the public hearings and consideration of the approval of the renewal of the 2021 on sale wine and 3.2% malt liquor licenses. Council is going to conduct, conduct a single public hearing for the licenses and consider approval of the licenses with a single motion. Um, and so I will now open the public hearing for the renewal of the 2021 on sale wine and 3.2% malt liquor licenses for the following uh, businesses. Chipotle Mexican Grill of Colorado LLC doing business as Chipotle Mexican Grill at 7644 Lindale Avenue South. Devani's Inc. doing business as Devani's Pizza and Hot Hoagies at 6345 Penn Avenue South. Joy's Pattaya Thai Restaurant LLC doing business as Joy's Pattaya Thai Restaurant, 7545 Lindale Avenue South. LRFC LLC doing business as Local Roots Food and Coffee, 81766 Street East. My Burger Operations LLC doing business as My Burger at 6555 Lindale Avenue South. 
Minnesota Junior Hockey Group, LLC, doing business as Minnesota Magicians at the Richfield Ice Arena, 636 East 66th Street. Patrick's French Bakery, Incorporated, doing business as Patrick's Bakery and Cafe at 2928 66th Street West. Henry Tao, doing business as Red Pepper Chinese Restaurant at 2910 66th Street West. And Paisan Incorporated doing business as Khan's Mongolian Barbecue at 578th Street East. Um, and we'll note that staff have reviewed all of the um, applications and see no basis for denial for any of these. Um, but this is now a public hearing. And so I would encourage anyone who'd like to speak um, now is the time and can pass it over to um, Assistant Wynn or if any of the business owners are in the meeting and would like to speak, um, you could probably just come off mute. Thank you, Council Member Whalen. I currently do not have anybody on the line, but I knew, know we do have a couple members of those businesses. So if any of them would like to speak up, you're more than welcome to at this point. Just a reminder, this is a public hearing, so I'll give one last um, opportunity for folks to speak. Otherwise, I would make a motion to close the public hearing. I'll second. Thank you. The motion has been made by Council Member Whalen to close the public hearing, seconded by Council Member Garcia. Any comments on the public hearing from folks? Nope. All right. Um, Analyst Martinez Gavinia, could you please take the roll call vote? Mayor Rita Gonzalez? Aye. Council Member Supple? Aye. Council Member Troutman? Aye. Council Member Garcia? Aye. Council Member Whalen? Aye. We have five ayes. Thank you. The public hearing has been closed. That delay. I would then um, make a motion to approve the renewal of the 2021 on sale wine and 3.2% malt liquor licenses for, um, again, Chipotle Mexican Grill, Devani's Pizza and Hot Hoagies, Joy's Pattaya Thai Restaurant, Local Roots Food and Coffee, My Burger, Minnesota Magicians at the Richfield Ice Arena, Patrick's Bakery and Cafe. Red Pepper Chinese Restaurant and Khan's Mongolian Barbecue. Council Member Troutman, I'd second. Thank you. The motion has been made by Council Member Troutman and seconded by a uh, motion has been made by Council Member Whalen and seconded by Council Member Troutman. Um, any comments or questions from Council Members? All right, Analyst Martinez Gavinia, if you could please take the roll call vote. Mayor Regan Gonzalez? Aye. Council Member Sapple? Aye. Council Member Troutman? Aye. Council Member Garcia? Aye. Council Member Whalen? Aye. We have five ayes. Thank you. The motion has been approved. Thanks, folks, for sticking with us for the. <laughs> The longest meeting of the year. Uh, I feel like the council should have made cookies for everyone on this call and hand deliver them to you all. Um, so the next items, items 18 through 24, will go to Council Member Troutman. Thank you, Mayor. We're conducting a public hearing uh, to consider and approve the renewal of 2021 on sale intoxicating and Sunday liquor licenses with an optional 2 a.m. closing. Uh, for the following uh, restaurants, and just switching switching screens here to find my place. Uh, this will be for 
um, we're starting with 21, uh, or excuse me, one set, uh, uh, agenda item 19, um, and that's um, El Tejaban Restaurant LLC doing business as El Tejaban Grill, 6519 Nicollet Avenue South. And for uh, the uh, Thompson's Fireside Foundry Inc. doing business as Fireside Foundry, 7636 Penn Avenue South. And for the Lindale Smokehouse LLC uh, doing business as Lindale Smokehouse, 7745 Lindale Avenue South. And the VPC Richfield Pizza LLC doing business as Giordano's Richfield, uh, of, excuse me, Giordano's of Richfield, uh, 3066 Street West. Um, and um, Los Sanchez uh, Ta Taqueria 2 LLC doing business as Los Sanchez Taqueria at 2 West 66th Street. And um, Lynn 65 LLC doing business as Lynn 65 Kitchen and Bar 6439 Lindale Avenue South. That's yeah, that's the end of the list. So this is a, a public hearing. Uh, so is there anybody that would care to comment on this? Uh, or we have to 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 move that we had open a public a conducted public hearing. I just uh, want to make sure. Did you say Frenchman's Pub in that list as well? Okay. I did not. I I don't believe I did say Frenchman's uh, Pub. Did that? Yep, that was the first one. So this this motion will also include Frenchman's Pub Inc. doing business as Frenchman's at fourteen hundred sixty six Street East. Thank you. Hmm? And uh, with the public hearing open, I do not currently have anybody on the line, but if anybody is within the meeting um, from those businesses that would like to speak, you're more than welcome to. Hello, can you guys hear me better? We can hear you great. Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Miguel Hernandez. I'm the GM here at Oh, I'm I'm so, I'm sorry, Miguel. We were off to a good start, but we we can't. It's we're hearing about ten percent of what you're saying. I I, I wonder if you're if you're at a computer and you could type in your comments, or you're at a place where you could type in your comments. We'd love to hear from you. We appreciate your restaurant very much. Um, unfortunately, it's not clear. Miguel Hernandez, um, are you, you're not going to speak. We're, we're, prop, we're recommending that these uh, establishments receive a license uh, and you're not a speaking, you're speaking uh, to support that, right? Yeah, we are not able to hear you, Miguel. But, but I have every confidence that that's what he's, he's, he's very diligent in, in terms of uh, fulfilling his obligations. Mayor, if I might, uh, Miguel Hernandez, yes. if you can hear us, if you would, wouldn't mind calling into our line at 612-861-0651, we might be able to get a better connection with you. Thank, could, would you mind sharing that one more time, um, Ms. Ms. Wynn, it just, just really slowly, if uh, uh, Miguel was not able, or excuse me, Mr. Hernandez was not able to, uh, to write that down right away? Sure. Yep. That number is going to be 612-861. Oh, I have him calling in. Give me one moment.
Hello? Miguel. Ah, uh, great. Hernandez. Oh, sorry Excuse for me. that. Thank you. To, thank you for the patience. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know how much you guys heard, but I'll start over here. Uh, I, I'm Miguel heard, Hernandez from the GM. Heard not, none of it. Go ahead. None of it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm the GM at El Tejaban, uh, which is owned by my parents here in Richfield, and we're really proud to be part of this city and to be part of the community. So I would just like to thank uh, the city of Richfield, the council members, the mayor, all the city workers who have been helping restaurants during this hard time. Um, I have come to find out after investigating how hard it is for many of us restaurants here in Richfield after canvassing and, and speaking to many uh, owners and managers that we've been very supported by the city, more so more than our federal government and or our state. So we're really grateful. We're really grateful for all the communication and everyone who has uh, listened to us and given this, this amendment to license for uh, 90 days and a reduced fee. Um, so I just really want to extend that on behalf of the owners of El Tejavan and many other restaurant folks here that um, while I do agree that the the license reduction and, and uh, the amendment to um, push it back was very helpful, um, as you can see, we're in a different position now, um, and I and I fear that that once again isn't enough. But after speaking to uh, City Council Simon Troutman and the Mayor, we come to understand that we you know this this is uh, nobody was really ready for this, even to say at some point the city and we understand that the liquor license pays for a lot of things for the city, and we want to make this community better. But uh, I. To, to see the position that we're in now, which is worse than a month ago somehow, uh, I really do think that we can c create more dialogue on what, how or, or when we would be able to pay for this license because um, I, I can speak for a couple of the other uh, businesses. We, we were in a dire place and well, even $12,000 at the end of January, which is already a time for restaurants that aren't very busy in, in a normal time will prove to be very detrimental even if we're not open or 50 percent capacity it's just uh something to consider but for now we're really appreciative of the time and patience you guys have shown us thank you mr hernandez and um we appreciate your family and your restaurant uh very much and um we, we can't wait for the moment that we can, you can open up fully again and we can all be there <laughs> um, and, uh, and, uh, and see you guys in person and not just uh, through, uh, through takeout. Um, and um, um, in, in staff, are there, um, is, is there, is there any, any vehicle through which we can have um, continuing? Uh, uh, Mr. Hernandez has asked about having an ongoing dialogue, are there either, you know, additional resources or a mechanism through which we could have a continued conversation about, uh, about the, the fees or other resources to, to help restaurants? Sorry to butt in and be a stickler on process. Can we finish the public hearing before we respond to questions? Well, then, yes. Thank you. Thank you, um, um, Council Member Whalen. So, that point of order, are there any other um, comments? Hello, this is... Hello, this is Jennifer Sanchez. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, yes. I hear you. Thank you. Okay, I'm with Will Sanchez Restaurant here on 2 West 66. Um, I am the office manager here. And we actually have another location in New Hope, um, Minnesota as well. Um, and they were actually able to give us um, a refund on some of what we paid last year in um, because we obviously had to close for 50% um, and we were closed for a while. And those were extra things that they were able to accommodate with us as well as reducing our fee and extending the time and I appreciate everything that you guys have done for our business. 
the continue to support that we have. I know Simon was in um, earlier and ordered food from us and all the support that we get from our community is really amazing. Um, but honestly, we are struggling um, and we continue to struggle as we see other restaurants um, continue to struggle and even close in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, it, w it was it was a pleasure to eat to, to eat at Los Sanchez this this evening. No secrets here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, uh, um, Council Member Troutman. You know, I know that one time you walked into to a study session that we were having, and you and you had some food from Los Sanchez, and boy, I tell you, you gobbled it down. It was. It, it was good. And uh, I, I think a lot of these restaurants, you know, please be assured that once once this nightmare is over, that you're gonna have a clientele like you wouldn't believe because we're all have cabin fever and we're all ready to go out. We're tired of our own cooking, our own food and the same old, same old. So we'll be we'll be patronizing you. We 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 want you in our community. We need you in our community, and and you have done. Uh, you're part of this, very much a part of this community, and we will not let you down. We will be there as soon as we we can. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And and this is a public hearing, so there um, is, is there anybody else on the line or um, or online that would like to speak? I do not have anybody else on the line. Um, and so I would, yeah, just one more ask if there's anybody else here from those businesses that were just listed, if they would like to speak, now is the time. Hearing, hearing um, no other comments, uh, I would move that we would uh, close the public hearing. Council Member Supple, I'll second that motion. Close the public hearing and seconded by Council Member Supple. Any comments or questions on the public hearing? Seeing um, none, Gavinia, could you please take the roll call vote? Oh, I, I, oh, excuse me, Mayor. Go I ahead. Was, if, if now at this point, would, would it be appropriate to, to just give staff an opportunity to respond or do we do that? Well, after? we'll close the public hearing and then. Oh. We'll that. Yep. Thank you. Sorry. Yep. Not a problem. Mayor Reagan Gonzalez. Aye. Council Member Sample. Aye. Council Member Troutman. Aye. Council Member Garcia. Aye. Council Member Whalen. Aye. We have five ayes. Thank you. The public hearing has been closed. Now we can um, go to the next item in motion and discussion um, or questions from staff. Council Member Truman. Thank you. So just to clarify, so, or, so now we'll, so at this point I would move that um, we approve the renewal of the uh, 2021 on sale intoxicating and Sunday liquor licenses with optional 2 a.m. closing along with 20% intoxicating liquor license fee reduction with payment due no later than January 21st, 2021 for the following restaurants. And bear with me while I just make my screen a little bigger so I can read the, uh, the print here. Um, for Frenchman's Pub, for El Tejaban Restaurant, for Thompson's Fireside Pizza Inc., for Lindale Smokehouse LLC, for VPC Richfield Pizza, for Los Sanchez Taqueria 2 LLC, for Lynn 65 LLC. That uh, next includes the list of, uh, of restaurants. Council Member Whalen, I'll second. The motion has been made by Council Member Troutman and seconded by Council Member Whalen. Any comments or questions from Council Members? Council Member, oh, Council Member Supple. 
I believe there was a comment that or a question that council member Troutman had that never got answered. Correct. And, th and that's just more more generally directed at staff if there's um, there's any any response to uh, um, Mr. Um, Hernandez's uh, um, comment. Council member Troutman, Madam Mayor and council members, I'll uh, have support services manager uh, Jennifer Anderson um, talk about the process, what we looked at, what we took into consideration, what we proposed to U.S. City Council members um, and as far as reducing fees and, and additional services, we also had to provide to the business community during the pandemic and the executive orders that we had to carry out um, from Governor Walls. So I'll let uh, support services Jennifer Anderson or support services manager Jennifer Anderson talk first. Thank you, Chief. Um, council members, uh, Mayor, there were a lot of discussions about um, addressing the intoxicating fee for 2021. And after um, after researching what other communities were doing around us, uh, we came to find out that we are uh, leading the pack, so to speak. Uh, many cities don't renew until mid-year. So, um, one of the things that, that we thought was um, fair was a, the 20% reduction, and that essentially um, is the three months that restaurants were closed. That is um, a refund, so to speak, of, those, of that time period. Um, additionally, we, we um, had several restaurants um, really considering whether or not they wanted to carry the intoxicating license this year. Um, a few of them decided to drop down to the line three two, um, and that was something that you know every every establishment in the city um, could consider, um, and a few of them did. Um, and so we felt that the the twenty percent fee reduction, in addition to offering an additional ninety days to pay that, um, was something that that the city could absorb and that would um, assist our our intoxicating license holders. Um, in making the, the 2021 fee. Um, it's not clear if there's additional federal funding or state funding coming out, um, you know, within, to be used in 2021. Um, so, you know, I think this was, this was one of the toughest decisions that, um, you know, we've had to make in terms of, of um, you know, our business licensing processes and, and getting, making sure that as many of our restaurants, um, you know, survive this pandemic along with uh, the rest of our businesses. So um, we felt that this was fair. Um, we've actually had um, several pay their, their uh, 2021 intoxicating license fee in full. Um, those who did, did receive a 20% uh, refund. Um, and so we, you know, we hope that, that the establishments that um, are still uh, waiting to pay by the end of January um, we'll continue to communicate with us. We're keeping lines open with them, um, and and uh, we're we're keeping our fingers crossed for everybody during the pandemic at this point. Thank thank you for that, and I just want to say thank you also for 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 being so flexible. Everybody's had to to be flexible on so many levels, but for making that um, that effort to work with our businesses to our our, our restaurants to stay open. Um, we really are pulling for for all of them to still be here uh, at the end of at the end of this this crisis. And then I just want to make a clarification, um, Council Member Troutman. I believe you meant to say January thirty first, twenty twenty, not January twenty first, twenty twenty. Correct. That's correct. Thank you. Cool. Great. Any other comments or questions from council members on the item? Madam Mayor, can I just comment on a couple of things regarding the yeah, liquor absolutely. licenses? Absolutely, Chief. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, along with what uh, Jennifer Anderson said, we, we were tasked with enforcing in public safety over 90 executive orders um, that pertain to businesses, specifically restaurants and bars. And we took a very educational approach on it where other jurisdictions maybe did more of an enforcement approach. Um, and instituted fines on establishments. We didn't want to burden our business community, whether it be restaurants or bars with additional um, citations or additional civil action. So we took more of an educational approach with that because we knew that this was going to be 
more of a marathon than a sprint. And we knew that these businesses with the shutdowns that uh, took place early on in the pandemic, um, and now some of the things that are going on as we hit the pause button, we're gonna be burdensome for our business owners. We did not wanna do that. So our goal was to work with our business community to make sure we could provide the best solutions possible during this pandemic time. And that's very hard to do because as general order or executive orders, excuse me, started to come out, we had to move fast, things that we didn't anticipate as far as outdoor dining and some of the other things that we had to move fast to make sure that our business community and our bars and restaurants could be able to be profitable under those circumstances. And in those situations, that took a lot of staff time um, that we did not account for. And so, you know, we're trying to make sure that we can do whatever we can to make it less of a burden on our business community. Um, and at the same time, make sure that um, we enforce those executive orders, but also look at the day-to-day -day operations of our licensing department. And our licensing department, excuse me, is made up of part-time staff. We don't have full-time staff doing these licenses. So, um, you know, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of background work. Um, and those license fees pay for that work uh, in addition to some of the other things that we have to provide our business community. So um, we're always here available to answer questions and work with our business community to try to take the burden off of them during this difficult time. Thank you, Chief. All right, um, before we go to the roll call vote, any other questions or comments from council? All right, Analyst martinez Gavinia, could you please take the roll call vote? Mayor Regan Gonzalez. Aye. Council Member Stoppel. Aye. Council Member Troutman. Council Member Garcia. Aye. Council Member Whalen. Council Member Whalen, I believe you are muted. Aye. Aye. Thank you. We have five eyes. Thank you. The motion has been approved. All right. We have one more public hearing. So if we can open it, close it, um, and then go to any discussions or questions, updates from staff, um, and then make the next motion, that'd be great. And this is um, Council Member Garcia, your last public hearing of your political career. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. This item is, is the public hearing and consideration to approve the renewal of a 2021 pawn broker and secondhand goods dealer's license for Metro Pawn and Gun Incorporated at 7529 Lindell Avenue South. Uh, these folks have been in business for a long time and they have, and, um, they have always um, been pretty pretty good about uh, complying with the requirements as as per requested by the city, um, and, um, and they and the public safety director has reviewed the background information and the attached documents and approves of its contents and seen no no basis for denial. This is a public hearing. Anyone want to speak in favor or, or against? Oh, go ahead, Mark. If you could okay. state your name and your address. Uh, can you hear me? Um, yes, and if you could state your name uh, and can address, I be heard? Too, that would be great. Thank you. Um, yes, the, uh, I'm the owner of Metro Pond and Gun at uh, 7529 Lindale Avenue South in Richfield. Oh, since 97, so it's going on. This will be our 24th year, and I am honored to have the uh, Council Member Garcia be her final reading. I, that's fitting and, and fun. Uh, Questions from uh, either the council members, the mayor, or staff. Um, I don't really have any comment. Answer any questions you may have. 
Great. Why don't we just make sure if uh, there is anybody else for the public hearing, then we'll close it. And if, que if questions are brought up, we can move to that after the public hearing is closed. I currently do not have anybody on the line for the public hearing, but again, if anybody is here, um, I suppose it's just for Metropolitan and Gremno, so I think we've heard from everybody. Uh, Council Member Whalen, I'd move to close the public hearing then. I'll second that. Thank you. The motion has been made by Council Member Whalen to close the public hearing and seconded by Council Member Garcia. Any comments or questions on this part before we move to the next part on this item? All right, Analyst Martinez Gavinia, could you please take the roll call vote to close the hearing? Mayor Vigonzalez? Aye. Council Member Supple? Aye. Council Member Troutman? Aye. Council Member Garcia? Aye. Council Member Whalen. Aye. We have five ayes. Thank you. The public hearing has been closed. Um, are there any questions for the owner um, from council members? I have no questions. It sounds like, it looks like folks don't have questions. I'd just like to say every year you come to this and, and you show up to answer questions and we greatly appreciate it. You've always been such a great partner um, to the city. If there's no further comments, or questions, you'll be able to be a really share. Thank you so much. If there's no further comments or questions, would someone like to make a motion? Yes, I will make the motion that we approve the renewal of 2021 pawnbroker and secondhand goods dealers license for Metro Pond and Gun Incorporated at 7529 Lindell Avenue South. Council Member Supple, I'll second that. Thank you. The motion has been made by Council Member Garcia and seconded by Council Member Supple. Any comments or questions on this? All right, Analyst Martinez Gavinia, could you please take the roll call vote? Mayor Regan, Aye. Council Member Supple. Aye. Council Member Chalman. Aye. Council Member Garcia. Aye. Council Member Whalen. Aye. We have five ayes. Thank you. The motion has been approved. The next item goes to Council Member Supple. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This item is to consider resolutions approving the 2020 revised and 2021 proposed budget and tax levy and related resolutions. On September 22nd, 2020, the City Council approved and certified a preliminary levy of $23,934,632, which included a levy for general fund operations of $19,001,439, a debt service levy of $3,508,545, a tax abatement of $54,043, an equipment and technology levy of $830,000, and an economic development agency levy of $540,605. Accordingly, the 2021 preliminary gross levy represents a 5.50% increase from the 2020 gross levy. The final tax levy of $23,934,632 must now be considered and approved by the City Council. Taxpayers have received individual parcel specific tax notices in, anticip in anticipation of the truth in taxation hearing. The city of Richfield has conducted and closed its 2020 truth in taxation hearing on November 30th, 2020. During the course of the public hearing, there was an opportunity for testimony from the general public. Information was also presented by staff regarding the proposed levy and budget. 
no official city council action to act on the levy was permissible on the day of the public hearing. Included on your consideration are salaries increases for non-represented employee paid plans. The proposed increases are 3% increase for the management and general services and specialized pay plans. The increases are effective in the first full pay period of January 2021. And in this, it includes all the related resolutions. That includes things like the capital improvement budget, the mileage reimbursement rates, the capital improvement plan, purchasing practices, utility rates and charges, public works on-call compensation, car allowances, general services pay plan, management pay pay plan, and the specialized pay plan. And in the resolution authorizing the budget and tax levy, it should be noted that the HRA is going to be $631,030. So does staff have anything to add to that? Um, no, I, uh, this is finance, finance director Chris Regis. No, I, I don't have anything to add at this time. I would like to thank um, Finance Director Regis and all of the staff for all of the multiple hearings we've had and the clear presentations. So with that, I would move to adopt the resolutions approving the 2020 revised and the 2021 proposed budget and tax levy and related resolutions. Council Member Whalen, I'll second. Thank you. The motion has been made by Council Member Supple and seconded by Council Member Whalen. Any um, comments, questions on this item? Council. I'll, oh, Council Member Whalen, go ahead. Um, I'll just say I know I'm a bit of a broken record now for Council and staff, but for anyone watching, if this is the first you're hearing or tuning in about our budget, um, I'm really excited that this, I think this budget is an investment in our, our values as a city, that where we spend our money is, is a statement about what we value and what we want to live into for our future. And so I think especially um, working on the police accountability and transparency of having body cameras, like the community has been asking for, we've had a policy for, for years, um, finally funding that I think is a step in the right direction. I'm even more excited about our um, equity coordinator position and really excited that the, the hiring process is happening on that and that we'll have someone um, in the near future to lead our efforts in that area. Um, and there's other, obviously a huge expense is uh, just to pay all of our staff what they deserve or try and get as close as we can, but to, to have meaningful uh, benefits and salaries and everything for our employees that they they really are who, like they are city services, like nothing that we do happens without our employees and that we, um, we need to invest in them. And so I think this, um, there's approaches to budgeting in a, a hard time like this that, uh, say slash everything and um and kind of tighten our belt and get by and i think that this is the right move to be uh certainly being prudent and um not wasteful but to keep investing in uh the future that we want to build for our community so i'm i'm really happy with this and i will also echo um the comments that i i really appreciated the process this year that i felt um I just I think we've really grown in connecting our budget process to the full like priority and goal setting process and making sure that we um, we're just integrating the fact that how we spend our money is what we want to work on. Um, so thank you to staff and everyone who's been part of that um, and expect especially Director Regis for um, kind of taking the lead on that and pulling it all together. So thank you and I'm. Um, excited to support this budget. Thank you, Council Member Whalen. I like the comments you said about um, the connection between our priorities, our values, and our budget. Um, I, I agree with you that that is definitely clear in this budget. 
And I, staff has just done a tremendous and exceptional job in overcoming all of these hurdles and taking those into consideration as we look at how to set the budget and how to plan for the future. And I, I just think all the different things that had that staff had to lead with this year, just with the budget alone, I mean, in addition to everything else that was um, putting pressure on, on our staff, um, they just did such a tremendous job. And thank you, city manager. Thank you to director Regis for leading that. Thank you to our department heads for looking, you know, at every place for cost savings, for trying, as our police chief said, um, you know, we're in this for the long haul and thinking about what um, spending and what staffing needs were, we were gonna have, not just up front in the pandemic, but throughout time, our staff did such a great job um, having to make the hard decisions around uh, what projects we might delay and how we can be more creative in finding efficiencies. So I just want to continue to give accolades. Um, and this is a very strong budget and I do think it will set us up for success and it will um, set us up to, to keep facing, unfortunately, tough years um, to come, but also at the same time to keep moving our priorities and our goals forward. Um, so thanks. I'm very, very proud of our budget this year and very proud of the work that our staff has done. Additional comments from council members. All right, analyst Martinez Gavinia, could you please take the roll call vote? Mayor Reagan Gonzalez. Aye. Council member Stoppel. Aye. Council member Chauvin. Aye. Council member Garcia. Aye. Council member Whalen. Aye. We have five ayes. Thank you. The motion and the budgets have been approved. The next item, let's see here. Let's see. Oh, maybe did I did I assign this to one of the council members? I don't have it listed. Is Council Member Whalen? All right, Council Member Whalen. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Our next item is to consider a resolution approving the 2021 budget for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Um, it's the first year we get to do this, so that's exciting. Um, on May 26, 2020, an Affordable Housing Trust Fund was established to support the preservation and creation of affordable housing in the city. Through its trust fund, the city can support the rehabilitation and preservation of existing affordable housing, promote, promote the development of additional affordable housing, and assist individuals with rental and down payment assistance. The city's Housing and Redevelopment Authority administers the trust fund on behalf of the city. Our 2021 trust fund budget includes funding for the following affordable housing programs, $110,000 in federal uh, community development block grant funds budgeted for the HRA's first time home buyer program, which provides up to 15,000 in purchase assistance funds, down payment assistance funds to home buyers who earn less than 80% of the area median income. Priorities given to Richfield renters, parents with children and households with at least one member with a disability and up to 11 households will be assisted by this program. And then secondly, $125,000 in Economic Development Authority levy funds are budgeted for the Kids at Home program, which provides a rental subsidy and supportive services to families with children in a Richfield school for up to four years. Households earning less than 60% of the AMI, area median income, are eligible for this program and up to 25 families will be assisted by the program. Um, with that, I will ask if staff have anything to add. No, I would just add that this is a, a little unusual in that the city um, is really tasked with um, approving this budget, but the monies come from the EDA and from the federal government. So the the city doesn't really have a lot of control over the expenditures, um, but this is uh, this is a budget we're hoping will grow every year. Uh, that we'll be, be able to bring new pots of money into this um, affordable housing trust fund every year. And uh, with uh, my hope is that next year um, you'll be approving a larger budget. Uh, I'd also uh, tell you that just while we've mentioned the kids at home program. Um, that's a, a tremendous program we're very happy with. 
and the families uh, that participate in the Kids at Home program are having their their Christmas party uh, next week. And so, um, wishing a happy holidays to all of our Kids at Home families. Thank you, Director Stark. Um, yes, and I, I would echo, I think both of these programs are uh, certainly not something every city does. I think fairly few do this kind of um, direct assistance, especially cities of our size. And so I think they're both essential to to helping people um, get get the dignified housing that they that they deserve. Um, so, and I'm excited to help it grow. So I will uh, make a motion that we adopt a resolution approving the 2021 budget for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. I'll second. All right, the motion has been made by Council Member Whalen and seconded by Council Member Garcia. Any comments or questions on this item? Council Member Seppel. I will keep this short because it's been a long meeting, but I wholeheartedly support this item and I look forward to expanding the programs. Thank you, Council Member Supple. I wholeheartedly agree with your comment. I am very excited for this. Other comments or questions? All right, Analyst Martinez Gavinia, if you could please take the roll call vote. Mayor Ray Gonzalez? Aye. Council Member Supple? Aye. Council Member Chaudman? Aye. Council Member Garcia? Aye. Council Member Whalen? Aye. We have five ayes. Thank you, the motion has been approved. All right, a few more items, we're almost there. City manager report is next. <laughs> thank you, Mayor, I will try and keep it really brief. I did wanna thank uh, Director Regis for um, all his work and leadership on the budget really quickly and also to note that we met with him today, Director Markle and I about the uh, financial feasibility of um, you know, purchasing the American Legion land and building a community center. So he is also helping on that project. Um, also wanted to let you know, and details will be coming soon, but we're working on organizing a, a meeting with community um, to uh, discuss the pandemic and involve Bloomington Public Health to meet with our business community, our uh, nonprofits, um, also the schools and faith communities, just to see if we can't, through communication, address the pandemic better, particularly the disparities that it's revealed amongst our BIPOC residents. Um, so that is in the works. And then um, since it is uh, Council Member Edwina Garcia's last meeting, I just wanted to say some, some um, thank yous that I had directors send to me um, we have put these into your slideshow. We are also going to have the slideshow be put into a video, so it'll be out on the social on social media. We'll put it out on our YouTube channel. And I have just it, they're too long to read. We've been here for so long. I would love to actually. Um, and some of the directors are still on. So I if if you all want to jump in, please do. You've worked with uh, um, Edwina for a long time. Um, but I pulled out some that I thought were really, really um, nicely done. So from director Phil Moore, your dedication and affection, affection for Richfield is only surpassed by your personal sense of humor. From director Dimitrenko, my respect and thanks for service and unwavering commitment to the city of Richfield for caring and support of staff and how much that has meant to me personally throughout the many years we have known each other. Director Markle, thank you for your decades of public service. You are truly one of a kind and will be missed. Uh, this is only part of a message from uh, uh, Public Safety Director Jay Henthorne. You have been a mentor to me a long time as a longtime employee to the city and chief of police. Your knowledge and wisdom will be missed, but you will never be forgotten. I had a hard time getting through these. Uh, from Director Stark, you're one straight shooting cowgirl, and I'm wishing you happy trails as you hop along to your next adventure. And then from me, um, Edwina, I didn't think I was gonna do this. We stand on your shoulders. Women in government have an easier path due to the trailblazing you have done for us. Thank you. I admire your grit, your strength, 
your ability to laugh when needed, and most of all, your dedication to Richfield. You lead with your whole heart. I have always loved when Maria calls you La Hefa. Since you inspire strong boss ladies everywhere, we will miss you on the council, but I know you will continue to lead and inspire in Richfield. And uh, this will be coming to your house. I didn't order it in time, but I have a little fat face mask uh, with, with your title on it. So if there are any directors on that want to um, personally thank Edwina, um, please do so. Well, Alice is uh, Kristen, Asher, Edwina. Um, I don't see you. Your video is not working, but um, just thank oh. you. I sent a note along that it will be in the, the slideshow, but um, just congratulations on all, all everything you've done and enjoy the years to come. I've really enjoyed getting to know you over the years and thank you for all your leadership and your feedback. Appreciate it. Hi, Edwina. This is Pam Dimitrenko, and I think um, while all the words of all my colleagues pretty much um, say it all, and but on the other hand, they really can't, nothing can encapsulate um, just all that you've done for all of us and the community. And so, you know, we wish you well. We know you're going to be nearby um, and still, you know, just pick up the phone and give a call too. So thanks again for all that you've done for for the community. So this is John. I would just add, yeah. you know, we we thank you for your support of city staff through the years. Uh, we we always know you have our backs, uh, and that's a good feeling. Uh, you know, this uh, governing can get you know a little messy at times, um, but, but it's always good to know that. Uh, that we're all in the same corner and you've always personified that. So thank you. Edwina, this is Jay. I just want to echo everything the rest of the directors said. Most importantly, um, I spoke with Betsy Osborne, uh, who used to be in Jennifer's position, mm -hmm. and she wishes you um, the best in your retirement, health, happiness, and, and all the good fortunes that go with it. But on behalf of public safety and myself, um, you've always been a strong proponent of me, of us, of what we've done in the community. Um, and it's been just a great joy to work with you um, through all the times um, that you've called me and emailed me. And um, I always like your Jim Prosser stories because I can remember working with Jim and, and they're always very entertaining. So uh, best of luck in the future and I wish you health and happiness. Adina, this is Amy. I'd just like to say thank you for your dedication to Richfield and being such a strong female role model in government. Um, I had such a good time last year when we went out to El Burrito Mercado. So hopefully we will have more time to go out to lunch together. Um, but I just appreciate all your support in parks and I wish you a happy retirement and a happy birthday. Edwina, this is uh, this is Kelly. Um, I do actually have a couple comments from some people that weren't able to make it to your retirement party that I'd like to quickly read. Um, Nancy Rowley, um, she lived in Richfield with her husband for almost 50 years before they moved to Texas in early 2020. She says, when I was elected to the Richfield School Board in 1987, Edwina Garcia was serving on the city council. Over those years, I grew to respect Edwina's commitment to her community, her family, and her friends. She is honest, respectful, and caring. Richfield reflects these values because leaders like Edwina model them. My relationship with Edwina began with a mutual commitment and respect for Richfield. It has grown to a personal friendship that thrives with 1,200 miles between us. Greetings to all from afar with a very special virtual hug for Edwina. 
Um, and then Steve and Lois Quam say, we have appreciated Edwina's contributions through her decades of public service. She has always been honest and direct in expressing her opinions, a quality that we will hold in high regard. Best wishes to Edwina for a long and healthy retirement. And I'd also like to thank you. Um, I know our time together wasn't very long and it's unfortunate, but I know that we will definitely um, go out to dinner and have some chats uh, when we are able to, and I'm looking forward to it and keeping up the friendship that we have developed. Mayor, can I speak now? Go ahead, Edwina. Uh, I don't know what to say. I'm just, uh, I just want you to know that I appreciate all of you, all of you. And I've appreciated working with you and getting to know you and sharing the same goals for our community and, and for forming friendships and, and, and just, I, I just don't know what to say, but you know, I am, I am blessed. My cup runneth over with love is what I told Blanca and, and Kelly. And, it, and, it, and, and I am just so grateful to the good Lord and to my family, but and and but you guys, all of you on staff, you know this is your city, and you show it's your city by all the work that you do, by all you give of yourselves, and by and just by working so hard to on behalf of all our constituents. That, that I am forever grateful and I will miss all of you. And that, that includes everyone from Katie all the way down to Paul, who, who is our, our, our janitorial staff, and everyone in between. I love you all. I thank you all very much. Thank you. We care about you so much, Council Member Garcia. So this is your last claims and payroll. Are you ready? <laughs> Mayor, I've appreciated doing claims and payroll under under uh, former Mayor uh, Debbie Gotell, former Mayor Pat Elliott, and, and current Mayor Maria Reagan Gonzalez. Nothing in Richfield gets done by by one person. It gets done by a team. It gets done by people uh, that are exceptional. Our city is just, it's a fabulous city. Everybody loves it. And uh, it, it it's not anybody that, that, that's special that brings it together. It's all of us together that make it the city that we have, a beautiful city, a thriving city, a healthy city, a city full of leaders, a city full of volunteers for, the, for all the commissions and task forces and everything else that, that falls under it. It's just an incredible, incredible honor and pleasure to have known you and worked with you and i know that the the people we owe bills to probably want to be paid and and our staff needs to be paid so i will move claims and payroll i would be honored to second that 
Thank you, Claims and Payroll has been moved and seconded. And Council Member Garcia, I'm done fighting with you. I have told you many times you are not coming back to any future council meeting for Claims and Payroll. So this is the final discussion about that, all right? Right. Um, Analyst Martinez Gavinia. Sorry, I just needed a second. Um, Mayor Rega Gonzalez. Council Member Sapple. Aye. Council Member Chopin. Aye. Council Member Garcia. Aye. Council Member Whalen. Aye. We have five ayes. Thank you, Claypool has been passed. The next item, second to last item, um, is the special inaugural Edwina Garcia Community Builder Award and Proclamation. Um, briefly, we are so excited to have this um, new award added to our, our list of recognitions in the community. The Garcia's legacy as she continues to uh, that we can have this award um, be a part of that. So, you know, Mayor, I, I can't, let's see, it, I, I can hardly hear you. Can you say okay. that again, please? Are you able to just share a little bit about how you um, thought of the Community Builder Award, what the purpose is, how it came about, um, and why you saw the need for this award? Be glad to, Mayor. And, but um, before I do that, I want to mention the fact that you, Mayor Maria Reagan Gonzalez, Katie Rodriguez, and <clears throat> And Blanca, Martinez, Gavina, and Kelly. Kelly, I, uh, all of you helped put this together. And like, and like I said, you know, we have an exceptional community. But all the people I mentioned put together a set of criteria that would give definition and substance to this award. This award is unique because it's for community builder. We, we, we all build community, but the, the, the backbone of the community are really the people we represent, our constituents, the residents of the city of Richfield. And without them, without the community volunteers in Richfield, we would be in a pitiful place. They have, they have done so much for our community and, and, and the person to receive this has done an exceptional, beautiful job. Uh, a committee has been formed and the, and the criteria is, is all set. And it's uh, it, and it's just it's just a salute to you constituents in the community. It's a salute to you who have built this community. You have built it in many, 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 many ways. And I salute you. I thank you. And I love you. Thank you so much for that, Councilmember Garcia. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll read the proclamation and then you can um, award the award. To so um, I will read the proclamation there. Yep. Whereas Richard C. Jabs has received the first annual Edwina Garcia Community Builder Award for his commitment to the Richfield community, and whereas Richard C. Jabs has volunteered in Babe Ruth Little League, West Richfield Little baseball and chaired the Richfield Athletic Association Consolidation of Little League 
And whereas Richard Jabs was president of the Richfield High School Band Booster, served as a member of the Metro Metropolitan Council Park and Open Space Commission, chaired the referendum for a new community center. And whereas Richard Jabs chaired the Richfield Planning Commission, chaired the Richfield Community Service Commission, and was a member of the two previous comprehensive plan committees. Whereas Richard Jabs was chair of the new Municipal Center Building Committee, chaired the Richfield Bandshell Task Force, elected president of Friends of the Richfield Bandshell, and was member of the Richfield Foundation. And whereas Richard Jabs served as a member of the task force to renovate the Richfield pool, was a member of the task force to locate the city maintenance facility and was chair of the Visions 2020 community spirit. And whereas on behalf of the residents and businesses of the city of Richfield, recognize and, thanks, and thank Richard Jabs for his tireless leadership and participation in the fabric and life of our community. Now, therefore, I, Maria Regan Gonzalez, Mayor of the City of Richfield and the Richfield City Council members, do hereby award you this proclamation for your service, demonstrating your commitment to the core values in the City of Richfield. So I'll pass it on to Council Member Garcia and Rick Jabs um, to, to talk a little bit more about why you picked Rick. Um, Council Member Garcia, it's, it's very clear um, but if there's anything that you would like to say, or if Rick would like to share anything as well. You know, one, one of the things, Mayor, is that, that I didn't list every single thing down that, that Rick has contributed to our community, but he's really an exceptional human being. He's really a hero. He's really a, just a do-gooder. <laughs> You know, he, he's, he's, an, he, he's, he's demonstrated if there ever was a um, definition for community builder, then Rick Jabs has demonstrated that he is indeed a community builder. And the, the award will read the Edwina Garcia Community Builder Award is presented to Richard C. Jabs in grateful recognition of our core Richfield community values for its outstanding leadership and contributions from Babe Ruth Little League Baseball to active participation in city commissions, task forces, and spearheading the new Richfield Municipal Center in the Richfield Band Shell. Rick, congratulations. And Kelly has a picture. I see she has the award. Can you like put yeah. it up to the camera if possible? Yep. So we did uh, get a plaque for uh, Rick Jabs, and we will have to set up um, a presentation for him here in the chambers at some point, but it obviously will be small and um, due to the uh, restrictions that we have. But we have this here for you, and we are excited to present it to you. Rick. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, yeah. I can hear you and see you. Okay. Uh, this is just wonderful. I, you know, uh, first of all, Edwina, happy birthday and um, and just thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your years of service. I mean, we've worked on a lot of things together and it's been wonderful. And, and again, I mean, you stand so much higher than I do. It's just amazing because the things that you've done for the city and um, I, I think the, the things I want to say is just that uh, I'm very humbled by this and, you know, I think I've got so much satisfaction out of being able to participate in the city endeavors and and, and help out wherever I could. And uh, But I didn't do that just with, with me. I mean, it was obviously other citizens that helped me through this and 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 participated with me and, and we got it all done. And it was fun. It was fun doing it. It was fun giving the council recommendations and gathering input from the community and just finding out what they really wanted and being able to share that then with you. And hopefully we did a, I mean, I think we did a pretty good job. We got a lot of things done. I love working on the commissions. I love working on all the task force. Um, I just love Richfield and 
And my wife was born and raised in Richfield, and we moved back here and, and you know, built our, our life here and um, our family. And um, I just couldn't be prouder of a place to have, have lived, worked, and played, as the expression goes. And, and hopefully uh, my contribution to this has just been more to make the city grow. And I, I, I love listening tonight about, you know, proposals for the future and, and all the great things. I think uh, you've got a great console going here, um, wonderful just just wonderful ideas and great plans and I love to see it continue on and I, I'm sure that Edwina says that too that she's just happy she can push push this forward and make it all happen so I, I really sincerely thank you and um, uh, I wish Richfield all the best in the future thank you very much thank you so much mayor um, a lot of these folks that volunteer and in whatever capacity they do in the city, a lot of it starts at the beginning when their children are little and and they become volunteers because it's so natural of, of, uh, for them to volunteer um, for you know for their children's um, events, whether it's baseball or Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts or whatever. It's and so it starts there but the thing is is that rick continued to build on all of that and the the more he did the more we asked of him and 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 i am proud to think that the award goes to rick chaps a good guy a good friend Thank you, Council Member Garcia. Any other comments from Council Members? Council Member Supple. I just wanted to also thank Mr. Jabs and to just say that over the last 20 or so years, he's somebody that was always out there leading in the community and it's very much appreciated. So thank you so much. Other comments from folks? Council Member Troutman. I just want to say congratulations, Mr. Jabs. Yeah, it's it's such an honor to know you. I remember uh, meeting you when you were working on the band shell and um, your encouraging words when I was first elected. And you have such a presence and such an impact and such an influence on the city. And uh, my heart's just overwhelmed with uh, with gratefulness. So thank you and congratulations. You surely didn't do all that work uh, for this award. You did it for the community, but I'm glad we're able to to recognize it in you, and uh, of course, recognize uh, our colleague and friend Edwina Garcia. I'm so glad that this is uh, that uh, this is this is part of her legacy. Thank you, and I'd like to say you are an example of a true public servant who just has such deep love for their community. It is clear. Um, and you've been such a role, such a great role model for so many of us, Rick. Um, and we greatly appreciate your investments over the years um, with your family and everything that you've done. Our our community is clearly a much better place because of your individual and uh, direct contributions over the years. So we're very proud of you, um, and so many of us look up to you and your leadership as a shining example of what true public servants. Um, how they serve their community. Amen. Pam's hand up is Assistant City Manager Demetrenko. Thank you. I Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't also just thank Rick for um, working alongside with me and our group um, with the building of the new community center. And honestly, I couldn't have- You mean um, community, the community sent municipal center not community center. oh sorry yeah it's the municipal center the but there's yes thank you edwina sorry and um yeah good point so but i just wanted to say that it was it's just always been a joy to work with rick and he is just gives it his all and we worked on that many many years and so rick congratulations uh, it's well deserved for you to get this uh Oak community builder award I just want to say again, thank you very much. I, I totally appreciate it. And thank you for all the nice comments um, and uh, keep up the good work. You too, thank you Rick. so much. 
Thank you so much, Rick. Thank you. Yep. Okay, the last item on the council agenda is hats off to home tests. I'm not hearing you again, Mayor. Yeah, we didn't hear who you said. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Council Member Whelan. Um, I don't have anything to add I, other than just my comments to um, to what staff shared and, and others have said in um, congratulating uh, Councilmember Garcia on her retirement. And I think um, especially to, to have the Community Builder Award, I know um, I know that's your, your favorite way to think about the work that we do for our city. And I think um, I just can't imagine a better way for the rest of us, for residents, whether they have uh, been around seeing you work here for decades or just moved here recently to keep working together to, to build up our community. Um, and that the best part is uh, you may not be in the same role, but I know you'll be right alongside us still, still working on that goal. So Thank you for all you've done already and all I know you'll continue to do and the that legacy of community building that you uh, leave us with. Thank you, Council Member Whalen. Council Member Troutman. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I was I was so glad I got to see you in person, Council Member Garcia. And, and give you your most important parting gift, which is a monitor with our <laughs> mutual friend uh, Vito. I hope I hope he's doing well. You better believe he is, but he misses you. Oh well, I miss I miss him too. And um, I just I just want to say that when I think of you, Councilmember Garcia, I think of strength and I think of love. And I'm we're we're still calling you. I still I still am. And you're you're not getting away from from uh, from your counsel and advice, um, but <laughs> but we will miss your strength and we will miss your love on this council, and so I just wish you all the continued strength and love for years and years to come. But your your leadership as as on this body it will be missed, and I just appreciate so much your your wisdom and your insight and your compassion. And um, it's just, it's just been such a blessing. So uh, thank you, friend. Thank you, Council Member Troutman. Council Member Supple. Well, first of all, I wanna say happy birthday because as thank well you. as having your final meeting here, it's also your birthday. So thank you for that. Um, you've been a leader for our whole community, you've been a mentor and you've been a friend and we truly love and appreciate you. And I would like to say that as a mentor, you've been very direct and that was, is really a good thing because nobody has to guess what you're thinking. But as <laughs> Council Member Troutman said, you also have some compassion and a sense of humor. And so those are all good qualities that all get wrapped up together. Um, one person who hasn't been mentioned tonight is Joe. And so I wanna say a big thank you to Joe for sharing you with us all these years because you've done so much for the city and he's been right there to support you. And so I just wanna do a shout out to Joe. So again, thank you so much. Um, I wanna wish you best wishes for a long and healthy, happy retirement. And I know you'll still be around, so take care. Thank you, Council Member Supple. All right, Hefa. Well, happy birthday as well. Um, we brought you a you big cheesecake. Oh, do you want to say something? Yes, I wanted to say, you know, that that I got a beautiful gift from the Richfield Fire Department. Wave Kiewicz and 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 Miss and uh Dovich, I can't remember his first name, but Mike. Yeah, yeah, Mike, Mike. I'm sorry, but I mean, this is really, really beautiful, and it and and it's it's got my name, and it's got the the, the city fire logo. One of one of the 
one of the things is that, uh, you know, the, the fire the fire department is is they're just natural heroes that were just born to serve in that capacity, and and I I think that uh, Chief Kiewicz and 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 Mike Dovich have done such a good job in in keeping the the um, keeping up with technology, keeping up with with trainings, keeping up with with anything that's brand new out there, but to make their jobs a, a lot easier so that they can put out fires. But uh, it, it's just, um, you know, uh, firefighters are just very, very special. They're, they're, they're heroes. They're out and, and they're out in danger. They they put their lives on the line for a, for a lot of us. They do their best, and I love them for it. And I and I thank them. And then Mary, I also wanted to t- thank uh, Blanca and Kelly, for the beautiful flowers, colorful and beautiful as can be, and. Let's see who else. And, and I, I wanted to thank. Um, I wanted to thank council for the beautiful poinsettia, for the beautiful cheesecake, and believe me, that's the first. That's what I'm going to have for breakfast in the morning. And uh, I, I, I love all of you. And Kristen, you, you gave me such a nice gift too all these gifts and all these people for, for my birthday. I'm only 38, but I decided to retire anyway. <laughs> but I will leave, I will say one thing, you know, I'm, I, four years ago I got, I got sick right after I had, um, right after I had been reelected and I've gone through, I've, I've had an autoimmune disease and then I've had COPD and, and some other, uh, side illnesses, but I I know the one thing I I've, I've gotten to know Sean Hayford O'Leary. He helps me with my technology. He helps me. He helps me with whatever he can. I mean, uh, I invited him to go with me, but we went to night to unite. Um, you know, he he always wrote, he always responded to the council, and he did so with a great deal of respect, and he did so, um, you know, with a real commitment. And he's the kind of guy that, you know, whatever he whatever he he writes in any in any Facebook page or whatever, you can take it to the bank because he does his homework. You know, he happens to be so bright and so talented, and I leave knowing that he's going to be uh, sitting right next to you, Mayor. And I and I and hats off to him. I depend on him because I know that he's going to be fabulous, and he'll join a great team, a, a great team with Waylon Troutman. Uh, and, and, very supple, and, and you, Mayor, uh, make him feel at home. He'll 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 live up to all my expectations. I'm positive, and I thank you for everything, for your gifts, relationships, for everything. I, I love you all. Thank you so much, Council Member Garcia. I'm going to wrap us up and just tell you how much I love you as a friend, as a mentor. Um, and there's so many troublemakers because of you, Council Member Garcia. There's so many people in office. There's so many people leading uh, because of, of how you've role modeled for us. I think of all, I mean, just the Latina 
politicians in Minnesota alone, you have mentored every single one of us and you continue to do so. Um, and and not just Latinas, but all women. I mean, you know, for uh, Commissioner Debbie Gotell, Mary, you know, so many people. Um, and so, you know, I just, I wouldn't be in office if it wasn't for you, Council Member Garcia. And um, your love and care has always been so authentic, so sincere, so down to earth. Um, and so hilarious at the same time. I remember you commenting on my the way that I dressed in my hair and said, hey, maybe you should consider that Amy Klobuchar look. And I was like, no way. <laughs> but <laughs> you gave me these real, you know, you said, come into my car. We're going to sit in the, you know, handicapped parking here. And I'm just going to be, you know, I'm going to help toughen you up. And I'm going to yell at you. And I need you to respond back to me. It's time to toughen up. And and just like having, you know, lunches together and spending time together where you were always giving such amazing life and leadership advice, but in this way that was just so funny and down to earth. Um, I think about, you know, you are the embodiment of Richfield, just so genuine, um, strong, sincere, and again, really caring about your community. So I just... Um, I, you know, I could talk forever or I, I could feel like I have nothing, you know, not much to say. I don't know how I, I express my most deepest, sincere appreciation and love for you. Um, and so many of us wouldn't be here today. And, and I just feel so fortunate that, you know, I've been in office for four years now and I just feel so thankful that even our paths crossed for those four years together on the council. Um, and I wish that, you know, I had been in leadership and, and in connection with you, even though our, our, our relationship was longer than that, um, for even longer, because the, the amount that you have taught me and challenged me to always grow um, has been tremendous in that little amount of time. And I just I feel like that is a part of history that I'm very lucky to be a part of. So I love you very much, Council Member Garcia. I know where you live and I know uh, where to find you. And I look forward to your retirement and you being a continued advisor and mentor to so many of us. Thank you. And God bless you all. Thank you. Well, on that note, folks, we are going to adjourn our last meeting. This is, you know, start your list of 2020 things that you want to say goodbye to. Put this on the list. Goodbye meetings for 2020 City Council meetings, the last one. And let's keep knocking off all that stuff off the 2020 list and say goodbye. <laughs> uh, but thank you. Thank God it's over. 2020 is over. Close. Almost. Almost. All right. I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you, everybody. Bye.